Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and I'll be, uh, uh, while Brahm is collecting money, I'll just uh, be filling in for him for very briefly. Um, the college has basically three rules. Uh, number one is one pool at a time. The second is we don't eat salt each other or each other's mother. And again, no, that's, that's not, not one of the rules. All right, Charlie. The it's third rule. Tradition. So, okay, it's it's a tradition. Yeah, no, one fool at a time, and we no personal attacks. And the third one is uh, only only tomatoes can be thrown at the moderator. So, um, tonight we have Andy Anderson talking about global warming. The college consists of three parts. We have our prepared speaker who will give a presentation, then we have a question and answer period, followed by our, our, our infamous rebuttal period. I think we are ready now to hear from L.P. Anderson. Yay! Yay. Who usually brings us folks, he is the, let's see, the coordinator or the director of the Northwest Information Service. Yes. And what else? <laughs> That's oh well, you will introduce it. yourself. <laughs> okay. Uh, so without further ado, LP. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, my official name is LP Anderson, but everybody just calls me Andy. And um, my brother and I, as a hobby, for the last 25 years, we run a, um, a public service, information service. I do speeches and presentations. Mm -hmm. Uh, my brother does the, the typesetting, um, you know, uh, the printing of our articles and stuff. What we do, um, basically what I do for sure, my brother helps me with a couple other people, is I, I translate databases of evidence. You give somebody a wheelbarrow full of paper, 50 books, and say you got two minutes, what's in there? Well, there's no time. There, there's a massive amount of information that exists in books, articles on the internet, like the one uh, we've got tonight. This one is 10 pages on global warming. Um, so I'm, I'm not, make, uh, I'd like to make it plain to everyone that I'm not an expert on global warming. I'm not a researcher on global warming. I am a translator. I translate the work of others from a massive amount of paper into a one or two page cliff notes or like tonight this is going to be a verbal presentation uh, I'll just simply you know summarize and translate a massive amount of published evidence into this one hour presentation it might be 50 minutes or something uh, but at any rate that's what I do is uh, the Northwest Information Service we've got cards here uh, with our uh, my phone number, you can call me if anybody wants a presentation on a, a variety of blacked out subjects. Uh, tonight it's global warming. What my brother and I specialize in is we publish in condensed articles and translations specifically on subjects that are intentionally censored and blacked out by the media in America. I would have made an announcement earlier, but uh, since I'm up here, uh, the first thing, I carry uh, this copy, a copy of Censored News with me generally, wherever I go. Uh, it's the single most explosive book you can own. It's published by the people at Sonoma State University every year. This is the new edition, 2013, Censored 2013. It just came out uh, like three weeks ago in October. <laughs> That's four weeks. Uh, anyway, uh, censored news out of Sonoma State. The students and the faculty, uh, they get articles sent to them from other colleges and researchers around the country. They sort through four or five hundred different stories that are not being reported by the mainstream media. They were reported somewhere. Uh, they call it down to the top 25 through, through a selection process <coughs> judging. They put it together, each year this comes out with the top 25 blacked out stories that would change America overnight in a heartbeat like that if they were covered by our press rather than blacked out. Now these stories basically, most of them are all covered around the world. People, we have 5% of the world's people in America. 
the 5% of the world's population that lives in America lives in a bubble, a, a nice bubble of media-generated ignorance. People in America believe things. They live in fantasy land on certain issues. They just simply believe things that are not true because our media, led by Fox News, just makes stuff up and puts it out on the airways. And, uh, is it, getting people to believe in a piece of mythology in America is a two-pronged two process. The media will promote the myth on all channels 24-7, and they will simultaneously run a coordinated blackout of what I call Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends saying the earth isn't flat. What are you going to do with Albert and his friends on any particular subject? Hundreds or thousands of scientists that have, you know, they spent their whole lives, careers, researching stuff, they built up a database. The only thing you can do, you can't, cannot combat the body of evidence, so you simply buy up the television and radio stations, buy the papers and black it out. You make it plain to reporters what they teach the students in this book. They teach journalism students how not to get fired and blackballed if you're going to be a journalist in America. You have to be aware that there are certain things that are absolutely taboo, and some above that are radioactive. If you try to you go anywhere near any of those subjects on mainstream television, the owner of the station will just dive for the red button and cut the video feed off. They go to commercial, and then you get fired. Your job is history. Now, I've heard, I talked to somebody that lived in Mexico for a while, and they said uh, in other countries, uh, Mexico in particular, if, if you try to report a story that steps on the toes of some big rich corporation, they just send somebody out to kill you. So journalists in other countries know that you can get killed for trying to report certain stories. In America, you, you simply get fired and blackballed and you can't get a job in the media. So uh, the, the subject we're talking about tonight has been grossly underreported by the American press because if the American people were actually aware of what the situation is and how bad it is, they would be demanding positive change. And since well, the last half of this talk, we'll be talking about uh, a myriad of solutions that are vastly cheaper than staying dependent on fossil fuel. And uh, fossil fuel, the fossil fuel lobby in America is very, very strong. A lot of people claim that the fossil fuel lobby really is the primary owner of our senators and congressmen. Our Congress, uh, the Senate and Congress is pretty much owned. Some people aren't owned, they're just rented most of the time. But, uh, you know, it's either ownership or rent, but uh, they control the Senate and the Congress to a degree that uh, George Orwell would have been proud of if he was alive today. And our media. I tell people if time travel ever becomes possible in my lifetime, the first time, first place I'm going is back to find George Orwell and shake his hand. Because our media has surpassed his vision of 1984, of how the media, Big Brother, could shape and mold public opinion. I mean, it's just mind-boggling that you talk to college-educated Americans uh, of all ages, when you get, uh, especially the people over 40 that haven't come through college recently, they're just uninformed, uh, completely uninformed about what's happening around the world. And so um, Bill McKibben, uh, the author of uh, the article here, I hope everybody got a copy. There's more up here. This is the basic text of uh, the guts of tonight's talk on global warming. Uh, it's a, like a 10-page article that summarizes the work of thousands of climate scientists from all over the world. But this is not the opinion of one person that wrote a book. So it's, a, it's a summary of a database. So if everybody is clear about that, we'll take a look. There's a book called uh, if anybody's interested in buying one single book, you can get this at Barnes & Noble and Borders. It's called The Global Warming Reader that's edited by Bill McKibben. 
uh, he's also the author of this one article out of Rolling Stone. Bill McKibben has been involved uh, with a, a website and an organization called 350.org, and it stands for 350 parts per billion of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. That's 350 parts per billion, isn't it? Or is it parts per million? Parts per billion. I thought it was. Uh, billion. But um, there's all kinds of articles in this one uh, talking about people that have been uh, studying, protesting, trying to enlighten the American public in the face of all the false advertising that's run by the fossil fuel industry on mainstream television. For those of you that uh, don't remember what the U.S. Committee for Energy Awareness was, USCEA, uh, they, they set the standard for the fossil fuel and the nuclear power industry. I, I, I brought two uh, picture frames that I saved articles from about 1985 where they were promoting the benefits of nuclear power at the same time, Forbes magazine ran the cover story that said it's the largest, costliest, most embarrassing managerial industrial disaster in world history. The nuclear power industry has been morally, ethically, legally, financially bankrupt for almost 40 years. They've been propped up uh, on welfare from taxpayers, basically, for 40 years, and the, the hundreds of billions of dollars, well, actually probably trillions now, that has been spent on nuclear power could have been spent on things that would have given us energy and allowed us to shut down dirty coal stations. Um, coal stations are the single most polluting form of energy source on the planet. Uh, China's burning a lot of coal right now. Um, the coal industry is uh, heavily promoting the idea of clean coal, which is just an outright oxymoron. There's no such thing as clean coal. Uh, you talk about um, the Gulf of Mexico two years ago, is like a, uh, what is it, 2010? 2010 in the spring. They had uh, British Petroleum had a, a well explode, and um, that story was un un undercovered in the United States because if the American people knew that drilling for oil in the oceans was destroying the ocean while also polluting the atmosphere and giving us global warming, the public would have been clamoring for cheaper alternatives. Uh, way sooner than they are now. Uh, in 1998, um, give you a brief update. In 1998, uh, a bunch of oil company executives, fossil fuel industry, they put their heads together and said, what can we do to keep America dependent on foreign oil and keep the profits rolling in for the next 30 years? They, they were looking at the uh, studies showing that the cost of wind power had been steadily falling. And by about 1998, 1999, right in there, the cost of wind-generated energy was competitive or cheaper than uh, most fossil fuels all over the world. And the cost is still falling. Today, the cost of wind power, if you remove the fossil fuel subsidies and charge uh, countries and people, if people actually paid the real cost of what it costs to dig for oil in the ocean versus what it costs to get the same equivalent energy on land from a, a big wind turbine. There's no comparison. Uh, and also, uh, recently, two weeks ago, an article uh, showed up in one of the solar uh, magazines showing that solar power has fallen to about a dollar a watt. Uh, it used to be six dollars a watt maybe a decade ago, something like that. The cost of solar and wind power as an alternative to burning fossil fuel is falling uh, like the cost of cell phones and computers came down. Mm -hmm. So in 1998, uh, 1999, shortly thereafter, a group of people that later became all through the key positions of the Bush administration, Bush Cheney, the oil company executives had a meeting and they said, we have to do something to take over the oil fields of Iraq and the Middle East and control oil and a, a, a big power grab for the next 30 years. 
but the American people will never go for an invasion and take over of Iraq unless they're motivated by something like some catastrophic event like a new Pearl Harbor. So uh, a whole bunch of people put their heads together and they installed George Bush in the White House after he lost the election. They realized they have to put a compliant corporate criminal in the White House to sign the papers and everything for illegal invasions of foreign countries, like the illegal invasion of Iraq on a pack of lies, the illegal invasion of, of Afghanistan on supposedly hunting for Osama bin Laden after 9-11. The only place they were hunting for Osama was across the pipeline route, the new pipeline that's being built across to Afghanistan to take control of the fossil fuel so, uh, fields up in the north of uh, Afghanistan. So. Uh, America, Americans are living under the illusion that our troops are fighting for freedom in foreign countries when what they're doing is moving people off the land where the oil companies want to build new pipelines or dig for oil or set, set things up. And so uh, the American people, our 5% of the people, spends a trillion dollars a year on the military to supposedly defend America, but that's what we're told on television, when the reality is they're keeping the, the third world, or every place outside the United States, they're defending American corporations who are simply basically stealing oil and gas and other resources from countries that can't really defend themselves. You notice that we haven't invaded any country that has even one or two or a small stash of nuclear weapons. That's because uh, they could defend themselves. So uh, if we, we burst the bubble of 9-11 and realize that there's no reason to have the troops over there, they're not fighting for freedom, they're just protecting uh, the profits of Dick Cheney and other oil company executives, let's bring the troops home and start spending at least half of that money in America. Right? So. Uh, what James Hansen and a lot of other people in the, the climate scientists, like there's uh, one study said there was 983 climate scientists on one side and three scientists uh, paid by Exxon and Mobil on the other side of the debate. The press presents this as an equal debate when it's not. Uh, you know, the, the evidence is overwhelming much like the evidence on the debate versus the flat versus round earth issue. The flat earth society in England still has about 2,000 members. But the round earth data, with the pictures taken from our space shuttle, the round earth data on the theory of the round earth is 99.9% .9 solid. You don't debate it anymore. They used to have learned, educated people used to debate whether the earth is flat or round. The answer wasn't known 800 years ago. Today it's known. This is how knowledge moves forward. And on the subject of uh, global warming, Bill McKibben and you know, a bunch of others have commented. He said 25 years ago, nobody was even really looking at global warming yet. They were just beginning to suspect that we were having a, a you know, problem with carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. You know, 40 years ago, I don't think there was 1% of the scientists even looking at this. This is a relatively recent phenomenon and the, the climate scientists that have been estimating how fast the Arctic ice is melting up at the North Pole, uh, how fast uh, the Greenland ice shelf is getting mushy, uh, how fast the permafrost in Siberia is getting mushy, the, the huge amount of methane is in the ground of the permafrost in, in Russia. If that gets uh, mushy and finally melts, It'll, uh, they, they predict it's going to uh, warm up. The, the, the global climate change will amount to five, six degrees of uh, climate warming, uh, where the sea levels might rise, you know, 20, 30 feet. Uh, there are already um, a lot of island nations, little, little nations um, in various places around the world where their island is only two or three meters above sea level. They, you know, they've been. Um, losing land uh, quite, you know, the last 10 years or so. Uh, as Bill McKibben said in this, this article, it's the title of it is called Global Warming's Terrifyingly New Math. 
I mean, he just basically, in this one 10-page article, he summarized the last good hundred books written by scientists all over the world on what's happening with the global warming situation. And as he said, the, you know, three, the, we've just passed the 327th consecutive month in which the temperature of the entire globe exceeded the 20th century average. There is no debate, as Craig Morris wrote a really good book called Energy Switch. Um, it's called Energy Switch, Proven Solutions for a Renewable Future. And in this one, he said basically, outside the United States, there's no longer any rational debate on the science, the science of global warming. The only place global warming is really being debated is in the United States where vested interests, i.e. the intellectual prostitutes that are on the payroll of the fossil fuel industry, those people are creating doubt and getting a lot of airtime and making it look like there is some kind of debate when there is not. So what's happening with global warming? Well, the ice hole, the hole at the North Pole where it, uh, it's ice free in the summer is getting bigger. And it's getting bigger faster than anybody thought possible just five years ago. They thought it was going to be another, a lot of, a lot of the estimates were for 2050. Well, we've got until 2030 or 2040, another 30, 40 years before we have to cut back burning fossil fuel and we can still keep the planet below a uh, two degree Celsius warm up. Um, he talks about three numbers. He said, you know, there's only, if you under, want to understand global warming, all you need to know, understand is three, three specific numbers. One of them, is what the planet would be like if it warms up two degrees Celsius. And now they know from all the data that's coming in that has surpassed their estimates of just a few years ago, if the planet warms up two degrees Celsius, a lot of those island nations will be gone. And another degree or so, and Manhattan will be underwater in 60, 70 years, something like that. But a lot of the scientists now are hedging their bets saying, uh, you might have trouble with Manhattan flooding in less than 40 years. Most of them, uh, from what I gather from studying the last two months, most of the good analysts are saying that we have until about 2015, a couple of years, to get a Manhattan type project started, like when they made the atomic bomb or the Apollo project started when they put a man on the moon. You pour billions and billions of dollars into a program and start doing something to make a difference because if enough carbon dioxide and, and methane and greenhouse gases, if enough of these gases get into the atmosphere so that you can't recall it, then the planet will continue to warm up beyond the two degree mark and then you lose the ice in the Himalayas, uh, the ice in Greenland begins to melt big time and then it just, it just becomes an irreversible cycle where the, uh, one scientist said, you know, you're it, you're looking at 40, 50 years, the planet will look like something out of a science fiction novel where uh, you'll have massive numbers of people migrating inland from the shores where, I mean, where are the people in New York going to go if Manhattan goes underwater? You're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars worth of loss and a lot of good places to live on the earth right now if you're on higher ground, it, it's, you're going to be right in the middle of migrating hordes of people coming in from 70 percent of the world's people lives near the ocean front or you know lowland uh, near sea level 70 percent of the world's population will be affected by a rise of the sea level of you know five ten feet it would just be a disaster of biblical proportions so that that message has to get out that anybody that's got kids or grandkids Think of the grandchildren, the kids that are two, three, four years old today. By the time they get to be 50 years old, they're going to ask, you know, or they're going to be able to recite in history, well, my grandparents got moving. They did something just before the catastrophe went over the edge, and we still have 
a lot of the oceanfront property that they had back in 2012. Or the other thing, uh, if we don't get our act together, these kids are going to be living in God knows where, what, what kind of uh, a future they're going to face. But it, it's, they're talking about a future that's decidedly different from the last 11,000 years of generally uh, stable, stable weather. Um, you know, the, the human race has evolved with agriculture and everything else. We've had relatively stable weather around the world where you can plan for planting seasons and uh, you, you didn't have whole crops being wiped out by drought or insects. You know, things have been stable for 11,000 years. And so it's only in the last 30, 40 years that scientists have really got a handle on how fast the massive amounts of burning fossil fuel has affected um, the human race. There's a, another good book for those of you that might want to uh, you know, check out a different book. The author's name is Ed Ayers, A-Y-R-E-S. Ed Ayers, and the title of the book is called God's Last Offer, Negotiating for a Sustainable Future. And in, this book has uh, charts about uh, four different spikes, four things that are happening that people aren't aware of. And I wish we had a slide for to show you. But anyway, they have graphs that look like something is uh, stable. It's stable on a long years like this, and then it starts to go up on an exponential curve. And then it's going almost straight up, increasing. He's talking about the carbon dioxide spike that's, that's happened since about 1800. And then it's just gone straight up uh, since the 1920s, 1930s. After the carbon dioxide spike, it's the extinction spike with species, especially uh, marine life, fish, all kinds of things in the water. That spike is, is again, it was just pretty much stable. Uh, and then around 1970s, 1990, just started going straight up, right out of sight. And that, that is, of course, the loss of species. We don't see articles like that in the American press, do we? Does anybody here think that the press has been covering that? No, I didn't think so. I, I, I didn't see anything. The third thing he talks about is the, the, the consumption spike. With the amount of money spent on advertising exceeds a trillion dollars of, you know, advertising all kinds of just things produced with the massive burning of fossil fuel, total consumption of raw materials in the environment. It's, you know, the spike is just going straight up since 1925, 1930 with no end in sight. And the fourth thing he talks about is the population spike, where you know, we had a, a kind of a stable population of hunter-gatherer people, low levels, you know, under under a billion people, under 500 million really, until about the year 1650. You know, 1650 or so, 500 million people on the planet. And then we reached our first billion in 1825. Second billion was 1930. Third billion, 1960, right? And between 1960, 1975, just 15 short years later, another billion. That's four billion on the earth in 75. 5 billion in 1987, 6 billion in 1999, and 7 billion around 2008. So the population has, has doubled, you know, much faster than the environment and uh, just general life supporting things can handle it. And it, it grew this way because of the massive, more or less what was perceived to be free energy from fossil fuels. It used to be really cheap with oil gushers uh, coming out of the ground like everybody's heard about the Beverly Hillbillies. Well, just drill a hole in the back and you got a gusher and you're rich. Well, those cheap supplies aren't available anymore. And so uh, our current president has been allowing new leases for drilling deep down in the ocean like what happened with British Petroleum. Um, <clears throat> The Gulf of Mexico, what happened out there, uh, the, the best estimates now are showing that British Petroleum 
BP, they misled the public from day one about how much oil was leaking into the water. You know, they, they, they reported it as, uh, well, it's a leak. And then one scientist finally said, uh, no, it's not a leak, it's a gusher, a giant gusher. They were, uh, but if you, if you're leaking 5,000 barrels a day or something uh, for so many days, then you can calculate how much of a fine you have to pay after the well is capped off. You have to pay so much money per barrel. I don't, I don't know what the current figure is. But anyway, that's how the countries figure. They, they fine an oil company, and they have to pay a fine if they uh, dump 200,000 gallons here or a million gallons there, whatever it is. So British Petroleum and the American media put it on all channels. The media, the American media was right in there with British Petroleum in giving the American public the impression that the Gulf of Mexico disaster was, what is it, 5,000 barrels a day, I think they said, when they knew it was between 60 and 100,000 barrels. And by the time it was all over, the total amount of oil dumped into the Gulf, and most of it kept underwater by the chemicals they used to suppress it to keep it from coming to the top. Those dispersants, they don't disperse it and get rid of the oil. They keep it from rising to the top so that it spreads out into the ocean, and a lot of it's coming shore in tar balls. Anyway, the disaster in the Gulf is 20 to 30 times bigger than the Exxon Valdez disaster in Alaska. And that was considered a big disaster when that happened. It wiped out all kinds of business in Alaska. Just a disaster for those people up there. So, you know, these kinds of things are a disaster of biblical proportions. And like, just like what's happening in Japan right now is not being covered in the United States. We would be, all of us, many of us anyway that could protest, would be writing letters, making phone calls. We would be calling for the shutdown and rapid replacement of every nuclear power plant in this country if we knew how big the disaster was in Fukushima, Japan, and what, what happened over there. Uh, the sense of this one of the articles, one of the top 25 articles this year, two of them actually. One of them is the the uh, destruction of the ocean from oil and becoming more acid and everything else from uh, global pollution. Another story is the 14,000 excess deaths, uh, infant mortality deaths that have been reported in Washington, uh, out near Seattle, as the radioactive cloud drifted over up out of Fukushima. Uh, there's, uh, the infant mortality rate has gone up all over the world, and you can see it in statistics, but you can't ever, it's like the tobacco industry used to say, well, we can't tell that that person died of the effects of cigarette smoking because that person uh, worked for two days in a, in a factory uh, that fixed brakes on cars. He was exposed to asbestos once 27 years ago, so we have no evidence that cigarette smoking was related. That's how the, statistically you know that 400,000 people die a year, but each individual case you cannot tell with, with certainty that it was caused by that one pollutant. That's how, how the, the polluters get by with creating an excess of 10,000 deaths per year on this, or an excess of 20,000 deaths over here, uh, because the science of actually proving that one particular death was caused by that pollutant is very, very difficult. And uh, in the fossil fuel industry, the nuclear industry, they have very, very, well, they have the best lawyers in the world, you know, the highest paid lawyers. Their job is to create doubt and win court cases. So. We're, if you were going to, I'll, I'll say one this about nuclear power. If, if, you, if you wanted to terraform the planet, if you wanted to raise the temperature as fast as possible, if you wanted to promote global warming and climate change as fast as possible, you would simply pour money into nuclear power plants. Because you pour money into a source that gives you very few kilowatts back in return relative to the money that went in, Many nuclear power plants are net consumers of energy. There's more fossil fuel has to be burned than everything else to build that thing in the first place compared to the kilowatts you get back out of it. Nuclear power is a net, 
is uh, many of them are net consumers of energy, so they don't they don't contribute to giving you any kind of clean energy. The pollution in any state is worse, any and nation. Their overall pollution, because they're still burning coal and fossil fuel, is a lot worse if they're trying to run nuclear power than if they just take the money and spend it on alternatives. These are these are ethical and moral issues, not just economic issues. You know, it's a, it's an ethical issue to promote nuclear power in the face of all kinds of cheaper alternatives. Same thing with coal. Uh, the coal industry and the fossil fuel industry right now is running massive campaigns to try to convince Americans that these new big wind machines uh, destroy or kill birds or they, they make too much noise. Well, as one author said, we have to choose between maybe killing a few birds now or getting rid of millions of birds 10, 20 years from now as the extinction moves forward with global warming. Uh, you know, we're looking at uh, massive patterns of extinction for all kinds of species as they try to migrate away from their, their natural habitats that they're in right now. It's not just about humans. It's about all species on the planet. Another thing that uh, is adding to uh, global warming is this concept of hydraulic fracturing, you know, for, uh, digging for natural gas uh, by you know, drilling holes deep down in the rock and then pumping toxic chemicals down there mixed with water and solvents and all kinds of things that are flammable and they, they fracture the rock and the natural gas escapes. Well, the amount of energy you actually get out of that compared to the cost is, is minuscule compared to the energy you would get if you spent the same amount of money on wind machines wind turbines, the new solar panels, uh, and those are energy sources, but the biggest energy source is high efficiency building materials, glass, insulation. Um, the, the knowledge, uh, I live in a town called Palatine. Five miles southwest of me there's a bunch of houses that were built in a town called Schaumburg starting in 1979. Houses have no furnace, have a tiny heating system, they heat for $10 a month the maximum, or $100 a year total. The builder gave those people a certificate when these houses were built, ordinary looking houses, they're not solar, they, they're just high efficiency. We guarantee the house will heat for 100 bucks a year or we'll pay the rest for the first decade. So the, the concept that you need to burn a lot of fossil fuel to heat a house and maintain indoor comfort, that concept has been obsolete for 25 years at least. If you count 1977 in Canada, it's 35 years. The Canadians have been building houses without furnaces up in Saskatchewan and all the cold northern latitudes in Canada. No furnaces needed at all if you spend the furnace money on the walls and windows. The windows that don't lose heat and walls that are two inches thicker with insulation and then you just have fresh air coming in. So the alternatives, we're hip deep in alternatives. We're just, we're, we're bathed in alternatives every day. I got one flyer to show you. What is that thing on? Don't know if everybody can see this, but it says <coughs> 10,000 10, to 1. All the books on global warming use this slogan, 10,000 to 1. It means we take in 10,000 times more sunlight every day than what we use to run the human race. That translates into one hour. One hour of sunlight coming in would run the human race for a year. Or one ten thousandth. We just collect, collect one ten thousandth of the solar energy coming in every day, and we can run the human race with no coal, no oil, no gas, and no nukes. So what are we doing in America? Well, several of the authors have summarized what's on that flyer behind me. It says the main problem with global warming is ignorance and denial. A lot of people are maintained in a bubble of ignorance by the intentional denial of the people that are paid by the fossil fuel industry to tell us that there's no problem with global warming. There's a Senator Inofi, uh, what? How, how do you pronounce that guy's name? Senator uh, Inofi. Um, 
Inahasha. 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 Uh, yeah, he's he's one that is uh, he sits on one of the committees that uh, is a gatekeeper for getting any kind of energy efficiency programs, you know, uh, money authorized in America. And that senator has been saying for years now that global warming is simply a hoax perpetrated by left-wing people who just want to make make more money uh, for themselves and uh, declare war on the rich. I mean, um, it's, it's hard to summarize how far out of touch with the reality those kinds of views are. And what I've run across in the last month, especially in this article on uh, you know the global warming reader, uh, there's an article by Van Jones in there. How many people in this audience are familiar with Naomi Klein, shock doctor? And she's got a new book coming out on global warming. She's got a tremendous article in this reader also, the global warming reader. If anybody's interested in a summary, uh, an up-to-date summary of the best of the best writing on what's happening around the world, this would be the book you would order. Uh, but, she's part of that uh, do the math tour. With but, there's a, a tour called Do the Math. Um, but basically, basically what these people are saying is we have to adopt the viewpoint that has been adopted by the 99 percenters, the people that started the Occupy Wall Street movement. We cannot sit back and uh, write a letter here and there. We, we have to do something more forceful uh, to get involved. As Bill McKibben, Bill McKibben has been uh, looking at, uh, at global warming for a long time, and what was the? He's got a uh, he's got another article in here on page two fifty one. <laughs> the title of his article is "This is really fucked up." It's time for us. It's time for us to get angry and get out and do something. Yeah. Uh, Sinclair Lewis said it in 1935 that it's very difficult to get a man to understand a fact if his salary depends on him not understanding it. Right. The first thing we have to do as Americans is recognize that we're dealing with people that we see on the media are some of the highest paid intellectual prostitutes in the world. They are paid to lie to us. And we've been giving these people credit for having a difference of opinion for a long time. It's not a difference of opinion, they're lying to us. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Ed Schultz, the radio announcer. He's got a show on MSNBC, and he's heard on the Chicago's Progressive Radio, WCPT, from 11 to 2 every day. But he's been saying for the uh, last six weeks, if you're running for office as a Republican, especially high office, your job is to get out there and lie your ass off. You know, if you tell people the truth, you're not going to get elected. You know, and many commentators have said this year, this year in the election cycle, we were exposed to more blatant, bald-faced lies on a wide variety of issues, global warming just being one of them, that they, they, have, they, they can't any longer keep us in doubt just by putting out opinion pieces. They have to lie, because the evidence is just so overwhelming <coughs> now of what we've got. And so that would, my, my suggestion would be, you know, I've been saying at a lot, the talks I give on a variety of issues, we say, first of all, if you're going to solve any kind of problem, it, it's a universal advice to seventh graders. You have to first correctly identify the problem. If you don't know what the problem is, how are you going to find a solution? Once you correctly identify the problem and inform yourself, then you have to begin to help others learn. You know, we've sat back and we've politely allowed people to have opinions, uh, you know, a difference of opinion for so long that the American public thinks that there's still a debate going on on many of these issues because you hear one side, if there's not, like 980 scientists on one side, three intellectuals that are paid to lie to us on the other, 
the media presents this as a 50-50 debate. You know, he said, she said. Well, as long as there's a doubt, there, there's uh, nobody can tell which opinion is correct. They, they, in America, a lot of people are being taught now that science doesn't matter. That uh, there's there's no way you can know anything scientifically because all you need to know is what's in the Bible. Right. Huh. They're yeah. teaching young people, if, if you have a chance, drive to Cincinnati sometime in the daytime and go across the border to Kentucky and visit that Creation Museum. Yeah. There you can see uh, uh, displays. Uh, they have a whole dinosaur wing where they have displays of uh, how people used to ride pony-sized dinosaurs for transportation 6,000 years ago. They got, they got, they got added, that, that's a, to teach something like that, it's not just about dinosaur and religion, that's a war on science. If you, if you can get kids when they're young to believe that and indoctrinate them, it's what Bertrand Russell called, he said education is nothing more or less than the stunting and distorting in the minds of the young in what's called education. And there is an all-out war on scientific thinking and scientific thought in America being waged by these billionaires that are part and parcel of the fossil fuel industry. And it's, it's way beyond just ordinary greed. They're out there in the area of uh, psychopathic uh, power grab now. What are you going to do with a person that says, I got two kids to put through college and I only got $22 billion in the bank? I need another 40 or 50 billion before my wife and two kids can feel secure. This is the mindset of the people that we have allowed to gravitate to the top and run our corporations and run the Supreme Court. As a society, we have not done what's necessary, what they've done in other countries. In Iceland, the people just said, we're not bailing the bankers out. We're putting them in jail. And uh, they just told the stockholders that you have to take the loss. We're not going to use taxpayers' funds. There was no bailout in Iceland after the crash. We bailed out the bankers here, and not one of them has been prosecuted yet. You know, we're, we're just there. There's a wide range of subjects. If we face reality on several different subjects and took the money that's being wasted on that and started spending it on solutions, we could solve the problem. We're hip deep, as I said, we're hip deep in solutions. They've been building houses without furnaces for 35 years. You've got 100 mile per gallon cars that are either in production or on the drawing board waiting to be mass produced. High mileage cars aren't for sale in America for a very specific reason. The fossil fuel industry wants to keep extracting as much money per week, per month, per year from Americans as they can. They keep, like, we have television commercials bragging about a car that gets 35 miles to the gallon. They got 60 and 70 mile per gallon vehicles all over the streets of Europe and Japan and a whole bunch of other places. They've been, you know, the clean diesels get 40% better gas mileage or something. These lighter, more efficient cars, uh, roomy, good, you know, high mileage vehicles have been on, on the roads all over the rest of the world for the last 15 to 20 years, and they're getting better and better and better. So there, there's no need to stay dependent, especially when the technology and the science now is pretty solidly developed with the mass production of what's called plug-in <coughs> hybrid cars. And um, I, I don't know if any of you are aware. This is a model. Of, well, it's actually, this is a small 10-watt solar panel. But the new solar panels are coming with a, a little black box on the back that converts the sunlight that falls on it, it's 15 to 20 volts direct current, it converts the power directly into synchronous 220 volts AC, so they're, they're called plug and play. You just plug them right into your uh, power, your you know, utility box at your house, you feed the power back into the grid with a special meter, and you just get credit for every kilowatt you produce. The country of Germany, Germany has already put up enough solar panels to displace 20 nuclear power plants. You know, they, they've shut down, what, a half a dozen or eight or ten, but uh, they're exporting energy. They're showing the world what it looks like to consider every building 
a source of electricity, cheap, you know, clean, environmentally beneficial, no pollution coming out of it. You know, the, the solar energy market, in other words, or the, the potential for solar energy is huge. As we said on that flyer, you know, 10,000 times more light falls on us every day than what we need to use. We collect one ten thousandth of with solar panels, you wouldn't even have to put up wind machines if you had uh, storage. So, you know, there's a, there's a blend of things that can be used for storage. The most promising one was talked about by Harvey Wasserman in a book called Solartopia. He wrote this book in 2007. It's called Solartopia, Looking Back from the Future, Looking Back from 2030. And he said, you know, take a trip around the world or across America, start in America and just visit cities and states. We'll fly in a hydrogen-powered airship, airplane, and look at what the people did starting in 2007 with the best available material. They went with the best of the best of what they had. Nothing new needed to be discovered. By 2030, we were running America with no coal, no oil, no gas, and no nukes. And they saved several trillion dollars in the process, so now we can provide universal health care and universal education to everyone, just like they have in many other developed countries. You know, America is, is an amazing place well, we're the only modern country in the world that expects a student to uh, it, develop massive debt in order to get college credit hours. Many authors are calling it the great credit hour scam. Kids are coming out of college with twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in debt and not being able to get a living wage job. And it's all of these problems are driven by fossil fuel billionaires that sit on the boards of the media and the boards of the military industrial contractors. It's our whole system that is uh, dependent on fossil fuels that are the driving force behind global warming. So if we, we confront the issue of global warming, where the money's going and where money is being wasted that could be uh, done to solve it, we can make giant leaps forward, like like Harvey said in 2007. You know, five, well, six years ago now. In 23 years, we could be clear, totally clear of fossil fuel. The, the country could be using hydrogen, clean hydrogen as a fuel. When it burns, you just get water vapor coming out the tailpipe of, of any kind of engine. You, you you burn hydrogen with oxygen, you get water vapor. But solar panels, wind machines, wave power, anything that generates electricity can be used to separate water into hydrogen and oxygen. It's a, an inexhaustible source of clean energy. But the fossil fuel industry, we're going to have to confront the billionaires that say, we've got uh, so many hundreds of billions. As, as he said in the article, you, uh, what page is it on? They're talking about... 27, the third number is 2,795 gigatons of fossil fuel reserves. It's five times the amount that they think we can burn and still stay within the limit of not going over the tipping point. The, the oil companies, the coal companies, the whole fossil fuel industry, they have five times more reserves listed on their books that they expect to sell and make a profit. This isn't new sources that they're looking for. This is stuff that's already there. He said it's like if, you're, if your legal limit in alcohol was like to have three or four beers or something, it's like having three 12-packs on the table already opened and ready to be guzzled. The, we have to confront the fossil fuel industry some way as a society if we're going to expect to survive on any kind of a recognizable planet that is not something out of a science fiction novel. And um, so that's, that's why um, all of these authors basically are saying this is a moral and ethical issue. This is not an issue about do we have alternatives. It's not an issue about can we do something that would replace fossil fuel even if we had to pay a little more, which we don't, we have to confront an industry that says, 
uh, five billion dollars worth of profit is not enough. I need another ten billion. Or you know, it's never enough. And this is Tom Hartman talks about this all the time. That's not just greed. That's a psychopathic tendency. Um, you know, the sociopath next door. People that have no empathy for their fellow man. It's just they're going for the maximum amount of money, power. And I can't remember which, which author said, you know, 20 years ago, he said, if any society that doesn't put a short leash on its crazy people is going to have a big problem when those people rise up to the level where they get to be billionaires and they're buying up companies and they're buying up big chunks of the country. If you don't confront it, you're facing a national disaster. And that's where we are now. This is what they're talking about, the disaster of global warming. Um, and that you know, we're just getting a spate of articles talking about fracking finally, but as far as I can tell, that's one of the top ten blacked out subjects in the media right now. Because Fracking is a disaster of biblical proportions because it destroys the groundwater that uh, fresh water supplies, wells, are completely destroyed and you can't use that water for livestock or human consumption. Uh, it looks like, uh, my own opinion is the fracking industry is, is promoting fracking as fast as they can yeah. so they develop a new market to sell water. The next, you know, because people need water to survive. So if they destroy existing water supplies and they, uh, like the Bush family, the Bush family bought 98,000 acres of land in Paraguay that sits over one of the largest freshwater aquifers in the world. They're planning on going into the water business. Smart. And so, yeah, uh, this is what you get when you're dealing with people with no ethics, no morals, and no conscience. And we as a society have sat back without confronting these people in any energetic fashion for so many years that we're, we're coming right up against, you know, the, the deadline. So, um, as I said, Yeah, as Bill McKibben said in, in his article, they were talking about, you know, what would it take to push America over the edge? That article was written, incidentally, before Manhattan got flooded. And you'll see it in the article there. He said, well, maybe they won't be able to hide this, that the global warming won't be so uh, something that they can just say, well, it's non-existent and everything else. They keep downplaying it. Maybe it'll take a disaster like a super hurricane that uh, floods Manhattan. No, they'll well, say it has nothing did, to do with global warming. Didn't we just have that? Right, right. Big, There's nothing. There's nothing yeah. that'll change people's minds. Uh -huh. Well, what'll change people's minds is when enough other people that understand what's happening finally stand up and say, enough. On every great issue of progress in the last hundred years in this country, it happened because the public got to the point where they would no longer tolerate it. You know, we, we tolerated the stories for a long time that were percolating out of the Catholic Church, saying they might have had a, a problem with a pedophile priest here and there. Well, now the public doesn't tolerate that anymore. For a long time we allowed this country to say that black people were three-fifths of a person, until finally we reach critical mass as a society, and you move forward. We have smoke-free restaurants now. I have not always been a member of the College of Complexes. I've only been, I've been coming here for five years now since the restaurants went smoke-free. I'm allergic to cigarette smoke, so I can't you know, eat in a restaurant where people are smoking like a chimney. But I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people that can't breathe very easily. They have asthma problems. Children have asthmatic attacks and things related to cigarette smoking. So we have moved forward as a society on that issue. Also There's no reason. What? Also from toxic material from the coal effluent. From coal? You bet. That's oh yeah, the, the, uh, a lot of coal burning stations are the coal burning stations are responsible for a massive amount of air pollution that's been causing, you know, the asthma attacks in young people. And in, in, in case, sometimes when you get a thermal inversion, there, there was a famous one in London where the, the burning the coal, it, it just got trapped by an inversion of cloud cover and it killed 4,000 people. You know, over, I forget what year that was. 1953. 1953. 
Uh, so, yeah, uh, you know, these dates are in the collective memory of a group like this. Each one of you will have a, uh, remember a date where some big disaster happened from, uh, you know, the, the fossil fuel or the nuclear power industry. There's a video, incidentally, you can watch. It's on uh, talking about nuclear power in, in Three Mile Island. It, it, they talk about uh, meltdowns or when radioactivity was released, and they go through a whole list. They said, was that Three Mile Island? No, no. That was Savannah River. That was Peach Bottom. And they said Three Mile Island wasn't the first nuclear disaster we had. The, the press and the nuclear power industry were very good at covering it up. So, again, the solution is to start being more energetic when somebody tells you that there's no such thing as global warming say time out time out that's a giant load of cribs and we're not talking about baby cribs here you know your friend says what does cribs mean well i said what you're giving me is cribs criminally insane bullshit cribs a giant load of cribs that we get ten thousand minutes of cribs for every minute of truth on the airwaves on certain issues in America and global warming is one of them. As long as the internet stays free, there are uh, so some classic internet sites, a bunch of good ones that post the best of the best of breaking news. I've got cards here with, uh, anybody who wants a card with uh, the, the top ten sites that I favor um, are what I call portal websites. Each one of them is a portal or a doorway and in the other world where all the blacked out news is. And uh, some of them are, you know, well, there are a lot of them are <coughs> reporting things that are happening and re being reported all over the world, but the censored news says they don't make the news. And why? We have corporate America controlling the mainstream news in America, radio, television. Now Rupert Murdoch is positioning himself to try to buy the Chicago Tribune and a bunch of other uh, papers around the country so he can do with the papers what he's done with Fox News. Incidentally, um, Censored News uses Fox News as the primary example. The journalism schools are using Fox News now as an example of how good propaganda is done. Now, Fox News is widely recognized to be the propaganda outlet of the right-wingers that are running the Republican Party. So help people understand that. There's all kinds of sources of beneficial knowledge that are all over the place. And my brother and I have been collecting uh, samples of solar panels and bulbs and all kinds of stuff for the last 25 years. Let me show you something interesting. This is a this is a small battery operated converter, and this this, this is a modern LED light. It's a, a reflector light that goes up in cans in the ceiling. This came out. Um, Costco has these for about twenty dollars. It's a dimmable LED light that's a replacement for a hundred watt bulb. It's a replacement for a hundred. It okay, it's, it's dimmable, and it uses seventeen watts of electricity. It's, it's one-sixth as much electricity, lasts way longer, and it's, it's dimmable down to about one watt. So if you had um, solar panels on your house, you could run appliances like this on one-sixth as much electricity as you used to use. So, you know, there's been a revolution in efficiency knowledge of all kinds in the last 25 years. Uh, how many people here are familiar with Rocky Mountain Institute? Show of hands. Rocky Mountain Institute is the Mayo Clinic of Energy Efficiency. They call it a think and do tank up in Colorado. They built a 3,000 square foot house up in the mountains of Colorado where it's cold. That house was built in 1984 and it has no heating bill and a $5 a month electric bill for 3,000 square feet. Now, since they redid the windows the third time and they put up uh, some more solar panels, the house is a net generator of energy and they sell it to the utility and get a check back every month. And so uh, people come from all over the world to see what energy efficient lights, appliances, uh, shower facilities, all kinds of things uh, can be built that Houses can be built that just run on the light that falls on the house. You don't even have to have utility lines running out there. But, again, 
the story is the same. People have to get the information out to others. They have to make the decision themselves to begin to invest in small things. It's a small, easy matter to change your light bulbs. Incidentally, one of those $20 light bulbs will save about $200 on the ComEd bill over a, a five-year period, say. You know, there, there's a bunch of things you can do to a house or an apartment, uh, starting with the cheapest things first. What? What are you pointing to? The, the clock. Oh, what about it? It's like we got to get the questions and everything okay. else. Okay, um, I was just finishing up anyway. Yeah, I was looking at that. So um, let's uh, let's just anybody's got any questions. Let's let's start the question period and we'll get it over quick. Do you want me to just point out the questions? I, I can point to them if you want. Oh uh, well, um, you're answering the question, so maybe I'd better. All right, we'll start with Ms. Heffernan. Okay, number one working campaigns, we agree with you, there's a book called The Republican War on Science or Corporate War on Science, but scientists don't work very well as political candidates. Mm -hmm. I can tell you because we ran five progressive positions this year, two of whom had enough money. They don't work well because I think they're touch wonky, and secondly, I think that uh, they get targeted. The position in Illinois got targeted this year by Aetna. He was supposed to win. They put in a $4 million campaign against him. And he lost. And so the point B, what do you see? What do you see is the best way for scientists to be activists? Because I think that it's very important for them to do it, and I think they should help us. But I don't see them working. Okay. Political viability, I don't see them as, as part of the. The question she asked is, what is the best way for scientists to become activists? Well, uh, they can study the work, or you know, just spend a couple of days uh, looking at some of the famous events in history where scientists stepped out, like John Goffman, Dr. Helen Caldicott. Um, there's a whole list of scientists that uh, have summarized the huge body of evidence and published a book, or they start giving speeches and presentations. Uh, it's a sort of a risk, but at the same time, I um, have to point out to scientists that it's a moral issue. You know, you can't adopt the attitude that uh, Tom Lehrer talked about in a song called uh, Who's Next, you know, once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? It's not my department. <laughs> scientists, have, scientists have a responsibility. If they understand something is happening, they can't keep it quiet. They have to, uh, you know, get it out, uh, start talking to people. And we can, if you know a scientist or anybody that's in that position, support them, help them understand that it's, you know, it, it's like somebody that knows about maybe a fire is developing next door. The first person that finds out about it, you have an obligation to get the word out. And, and this is the information, this is a, a message you, you have to get across to anybody that's working in the scientific fields if they, if they can benefit. I mean, get the word out to people. Okay? All right. Eliano. What's the question? My question is, in your opinion, you think it's some benefits a little bit from the global warming to help our energy to run? Because from my understanding, what I heard your speech, it's like when it's not global ice time, uh, 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 wait, when it's not global colding, it's not it's global warming, then from my understanding, I think it benefits to produce energy better than if it's going to be cold. <laughs> you understand my question? Like some benefits for the keep energy going, like gas energy and... I think if I ask, if I understand your question, you're asking if it would, would we be able to produce more energy if, if the planet warms up? Well, I don't think so. Um, we're already, it's not a question of how much energy we're producing. We're already producing a massive amount with fossil fuels, and we have a massive amount of solar intake to use. It's a question of confronting the industries that are killing the planet. That's the issue. 
You know, we're, we're, we're completely bathed in energy efficiency, energy alternatives of all kinds that would be cheaper and more beneficial than fossil fuels if we confront these industries. Thank you. All right. uh, Tim Bolger and then Charlie. All right, Dana. Andy, if you were president for a day or energy czar for one day, what would be the two or three things you would do in office to solve this global warming problem? The question well, was... I mean, just, just directives or, or what? If I was energy czar for a day or two or three, what would be the three things I would do to solve global warming or promote... Well, the first thing you would do, you know, you would, you would, you would put a ban on fracking because that uh, goes right to the water supplies everywhere. Um, the next thing you would do um, is simply declare, as, as other countries have, that you're, you're going to transfer money into efficient alternatives as fast as possible. If I was President of the United States, I would bring the troops home from everywhere and save half a trillion dollars a year. Take half a trillion dollars, 500 billion, and start putting up wind machines and solar panels. Like, like Germany is for a fraction of that money, Germany is, is looking toward energy efficiency. I mean, energy sufficiency without fossil fuel very fast. Sweden is looking at complete sufficiency by 2020. It's happening fast in other countries when they've, they've made a national commitment, like, like the Apollo program, to put a man on the moon. It's, it's a question of political will and commitment. It's not a question of having materials and alternatives available that we can use. It's strictly a political thing, developing the political will, and we have to do that as a society some way. Somebody else, Brian? Tim? Uh, let's you, you, you uh, just Charles? Yeah, Andy, you, you told us all about the nefarious oil industry and so forth, and then you come along and from a transportation perspective, you tell us your your recommendation is is highly efficient oil burning automobiles. I didn't now, say what that. about Charlie. light rail, high speed? No, we've talked about 16, 70 mile per hour cars. What about sustainable communities? Light rail, public transit, high speed rail. All, I, all I, those things. I don't. Be I don't believe there should be any cars whatsoever. <laughs> I, don't give a, I don't give a fuck how I don't care if, you, if you're going to get off oil, are you going to get off it or not? Yeah, 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 to answer your question, Charlie, if we had two or three hours, we would talk about all the programs around the world that are uh, they're developing high-speed rail, you know, the, the electric trains. You know, you can have electric mass transit that's run off wind and solar. You can have a whole fleet of plug-in hydrogen powered vehicles. Even, you can you can have a you can have an electric press. vehicle that's hydrogen powered, no fossil fuel. What, what do you, you you mentioned pollutants. What do you think comes out of a high efficient at a seventy mile per or per gallon car? The same poison comes out of it. You missed it, Charlie. You missed when I said these vehicles can be run on hydrogen. And when it burns you get that's water worse. water worse. water vapor. Yes it is. It's that's clean worse. water vapor coming out the tank, hydrogen Charlie. Is the worst that it's clean burning and you get right. water vapor. That's okay. it. So just read up on it a little bit or we'll <laughs> yeah. do, do a, a, a different it's program. In the air. Okay, yeah. Bob Rosenstein. The Atchison, Topeka, oh. and the Shinkansen. Oh. Well, let me ask this question. As a physicist and a chemist and a political activist since 1956, <sighs> what, what do we have to do to make President Obama's uh, highest priority in the second term? Uh, mitigating the global climate crisis and working in concert with uh, other nations in the world like China and India that are, are high polluters to uh, transform our economies and our societies to one based on sustainability and clean renewable energy, including hydrogen, wind, solar, geothermal, and so forth. Uh, the question was, he basically asked, what do we have to do to move President Obama to <coughs> start promoting, you know, a clean, efficient future that's non-polluting. Well, the only thing I can think of is what all of these authors have been talking about is get politically active. Get active in your community, help people build things, uh, point people in the direction of efficiency, of all kinds of things. But uh, as one author said, forget about insulating your attic this much, 
uh, they put that off and uh, get politically active, try to help people make a difference at the political level, state, local, state, and national. And, uh, you know, start at the local level, but there's a, a town called Osage, Iowa, where the, uh, back in 30 years ago, the utility, uh, the citizens formed this group with the utility, and the utility put up the money to weatherize homes. And everybody, uh, you know, they, they generated a lot of excess money, and they cut their pollution way down. Uh, they weren't worried about pollution. It was talking about energy efficiency, but that's how you do it. You get act. You, we, we can't sit back in our homes. We have to get out and get active in a variety of ways. And, you know, short of that, I, I don't know what the answer is if people don't get active. I don't think Obama will move unless we pressure him. I think that's a good point. All right. Um, Mike Foley and then Don. Randy, I got the same stupid question I always ask. Al Gore says there's no such thing as a global warming problem. Al Gore says he can burn billions and billions of tons of coal. It doesn't pollute, it doesn't cause global warming, none of that. As long as you pay off his buddy and give his buddy a couple thousand dollars, and he gives you a piece of paper that says carbon credit on it. Correct question? Yes. The question is, why doesn't everybody give Al Gore's buddy 20 bucks, and there will never be, again, a piece of paper that says carbon credit, you got to have that. Why doesn't everybody give Al Gore's buddy 20 bucks, and we'll never have pollution in the world ever again? Al Gore said it. Uh, I mean, Al Gore said there's no such what, thing. What's the no question? Anymore. What, what the question, question do you have for me? Why don't we all just give Al Gore's buddy 20 bucks and get the piece of paper that says carbon credit, and there will never be any pollution again? Uh, Al Gore said. You have it. asked your question. Okay. I just asked the question again. I, I think an investment of 20 dollars from everybody wouldn't make much of a dent in it. Al Gore said it would. Well. Al Gore said if you get the piece of paper that says carbon credit. Never I think in answer to your question, uh, they have shifted the debate a lot. Since, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, they may have thought that carbon credits, cap and trade, would make much of a difference. Now, the thinking of most of these people, Al Gore included, from what I'm gathering here, is that, you know, bribing people with, you know, carbon credits and stuff isn't the way to go. Yeah, Al Gore got all kind of awards, Emmys, and uh, uh, that's look, back then. Mike, no a question is a question. Mike, that, that's you've gotten an answer. We're moving to the next question. Okay. Next question. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Bob. okay. Okay. I was just I was writing some stuff. Okay. Ready. All right, um, Andy. Uh, listen, hey, 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 uh, listen, uh, Charlie. Can, 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 can I just ask, ask my question first, and then you can talk? <laughs> okay. Well, excuse me. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, all right. Uh, all right. I just wanted. This is sort of a little bit of a follow up um, to, to Mike and and the person before. Uh, Bob wrote. Bob. What? I don't know if anybody asked you this question while I was in the bathroom, but um, what is what has President Obama done about global warming? Question is, what's President Obama done about global warming? Mm -hmm. um, he promised on his campaign in 2008 that he would start pushing America in a green direction, but uh, that got co-opted really quick after he was inaugurated in 2009. Um, the president has not done nearly as much. Well, he, he needs to do more, and we need to push him. And uh, there's a famous quote from Franklin Roosevelt back in the 30s. You know, he said, uh, he told some senators and some people, he said, I, we passed the law or something, now go out there and make me do this. You know, uh, you know in other words, get public support and push the president in that direction uh, with massive public support. Uh, we won't get a lot of political action just expecting these people to do it on their own. That's, that's what Bill McKimmon's saying. The, the, this situation is really screwed up and it's, it's time for moral outrage and action. What we've been doing, writing polite letters, electing them, hoping they're going to do things after we elect them, that hasn't been working. Both the Democrat and Republican Party have been wholly owned by the fossil fuel industry for the last 25 years. So it's time for something different. Get, start thinking of creative things. What well, matter? Yeah, and the, um, uh, when do you think uh, that the, the war with Iran will start? And don't you admit now that 
George Bush is looking pretty smart for having us uh, uh, being positioned in Iraq right now for the coming war with Iran. We've got the people, we've got the, we've got the equipment, everything all in place. <laughs> The question is, when do I think the war in Iran is going to start? Is that because of the oil uh, production and everything? We take over Iran? Well, well it's because of their nuclear, you know, activities. I, I'm thinking, uh, I'm hoping that the war, there is no war with Iran. We're hoping that cooler heads are going to prevail. And uh, as we talked about before, uh, George Bush is not looking like he was really smart for evading Iraq. George Bush is looking like he has to avoid traveling in foreign countries where there are international arrest warrants out for his sorry butt. He's considered an international war criminal by what he did in Iraq. And he can't, they were talking about this on the radio early, George, George and Dick can't travel very far outside the United States without massive armed guards around them or they'll get arrested and prosecuted for international war crimes for what they did in Iraq. So, uh, uh, Amory Lovins, to answer the other point, Amory Lovins has been saying for 15 years, tell the Middle East to keep the oil. It's ancient dinosaur residue. We don't need it. We got cheaper alternatives right here in America. Just bring the troops home and tell them to keep their oil. If we, if we had the political will to do that, to confront the billionaires that are running our military industrial complex, that would be the way to go. It would be cheaper. It would be vastly cheaper than what we're doing with spending a, a million dollars a year to keep a troop in Afghanistan or Iraq. Next follow up do, do we have the, uh, the farmland available to make growing biodiesel a viable alternative? Oh, the other question, do we have the farmland to make biodiesel? Uh, you, making biodiesel with farmland, you know, growing food to burn it for fuel is considered morally reprehensive by many countries around the world. You know, crops that are grown, food crops should be used for food. We have, uh, we don't need, we don't need to be growing crops and, and spending fertilizer and uh, tractor fuel and everything else to get fuel. We need to put up cheaper solar panels. Solar and wind power are vastly cheaper than biodiesel right today. Is that clear to everybody? I hope so. And Rios. I don't understand your cost on the solar panel. I understand that I pay about 17 cents a kilowatt for electricity, but the solar panel price you quoted was a dollar. But what's that dollar? Because when I spend 17 cents for electricity and I use that kilowatt, it's gone. But when I spend for a dollar per kilowatt for a solar panel, and I generate a kilowatt, then I generate another one the next day, and another one the next day, and another one the day after, I don't understand what that price of one dollar per kilowatt is. Uh, he's questioning the, the, the current quoted price of some companies, saying the solar panels have come down to a dollar a watt. That, that's the wholesale cost of the panels. Like a thousand watts of solar uh, would cost a thousand dollars if you bought it from a wholesaler, where um, you know it's a thousand dollars a kilowatt maybe. Nuclear power to build a nuclear plant is five or six thousand dollars a kilowatt. But should I look at it that way? Because if I spend a thousand dollars for a thousand kilowatts, I have spent a thousand dollars, and I generate a thousand kilowatts today, tomorrow, the next day, the day after, and in a year. I generate 365,000 kilowatts. Right, yeah, well, well you, 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 you compare the cost of the total solar system versus how much energy it's going to produce for you over, say, 25 years. A $40,000 solar system three years ago has fallen to $16,000 installed in today's prices. The cost of installed solar systems is coming down fast, like the cost of laptop computers cell phones, DVD players. It's going through the same kind of cost reduction. And in places where you pay 17 cents a kilowatt hour, like you know New York or someplace inexpensive in California, rooftop solar systems installed are cost competitive with the utility in, on about an equal footing with the utility prices right now. So as utility costs rise and solar falls, uh, General Electric said solar, solar panels on the average roof are going to be competitive with most utilities by 2015. That's two years from now. 
This yeah. isn't 40 or 50 years out in the future. So what, what we're having on solar is the early people, yes, uh, some people uh, some people bought DVRs, video players, when they were $500 a piece. They were the first responders, in other words, or the people that pioneered the sales. And then the price fell, and now you can buy a video player for 50 bucks. Uh, but you know the the expensive solar systems have really dropped in price. We're not we're not in the early stages anymore. It's very close to going mass market. Like when uh, when the squirrely uh, light bulbs got down under five dollars a bulb, and then the sales just took off. Okay. Uh, Lisa. I this is short. I have a friend whose son is is big in solar in California. He's from Illinois. He would love to go into business here, but the utility companies won't allow him to. And yes. I think there's a perception. What's your question? There's a perception that that because we're in Illinois, we don't have enough uh, sunlight to to run solar, and this this is not correct. Do you have what, what, what's your question? My, well, my question is what what do we do? What, what can we do in Illinois to get solar? What can, the question is, what can we do in Illinois to get solar power? Well, the first thing is some people that have a little money to invest and want, want to invest in something, rather than put it in the stock market, invest a few thousand dollars in panels and put it on your roof and brag about it to friends and neighbors. Yeah. You have to have people buying a product initially and developing a market. That's one thing. Another thing is help educate the general public that solar energy is really usable in Illinois. Uh, Illinois has plenty of sunshine for solar. One of the, we published an article in 1985, one of the top three pieces of mythology, they're going for the Golden Shovel Award, was that ComEd was putting out information saying uh, the sun doesn't shine in Chicago. We, you know, solar would never be used here because we don't have enough sun. I mean, it's just, this is advertising. And, and people are misled, and the, the information is easy to find now on the internet. You know, before 1998, there was no Google. Just 14 years now, and you know, we're, we're in a different world with information now. You can do it a day on the internet, what used to take 20 years in a library. So you know, log, if you've never logged on to Rocky Mountain Institute, you know, take one of my cards and, and log on. And uh, you know, tell all your friends, just tell them about the site and you know, educate people. That, that's what I'm talking about, getting active. Tell people, I'm constantly giving people a card on this subject or that one or that one here. Go here and you know, here's a bunch of good stuff. Because it's not in the newspapers. The Tribune doesn't talk about it. Bob Luxembourg? Could you um, summarize what was publicized about the, the findings of NASA, the recent findings of NASA about global warming? And climate change. Could you summarize those in as objective way as possible, please? Yeah, ask what. Can I summarize? You know, it's like trying to cram Translate. 200 pounds of crap into a 20 pound bag. Oh. Um, what was NASA's? James Hansen is a longtime researcher from NASA, and his current work uh, published the last month or two, you know, that they've been working on. Their, their latest thinking is that we've got a couple of years, two or three years tops to get a program started like the Manhattan Project or the Apollo Project to put a man on the moon. Um, if, if we continue to dump fossil fuel, carbon dioxide, and others into the atmosphere at the rate we're going, they said you know, the total amount that we could put in the atmosphere over 50 years, say, we would burn through that allotment in the next 15, 16 years, and uh, by if we don't get a massive program of reduction started by 2015, they think we'll pass the tipping point where the, the permafrost in Russia is going to thaw out along with Greenland, and then it's just a, a self, uh, uh, what do you call it? Self-perpetuating. Self-perpetuating, uh, I couldn't think of the word perpetuating, a self-perpetuating cycle right. where the planet's just going to warm up 10 or 11 degrees. Okay. And it will be something totally different than any of us have ever seen uh, outside of the science fiction movies. Uh, Ivan? Ivan Roy? Yeah. Uh, I think you conveyed a lot of uh, complex issues, political, and scientific, etc. But I, I want to focus on the, on, on the price model. Uh, you mentioned some trends, you know, the price of DVRs going down, the price of uh, environmental cells going down over the years. What's wrong with uh, the price system? Uh, 
making these changes that uh, you're advocating tonight uh, when um, price, the concept of price conveys a lot of information to us, the electorate, in the sense that, hey, if we can tolerate five bucks a, a, a gallon, uh, maybe we won't, we won't do anything. We'll just come here and talk, talk or speak on the topic and Is there a question? Our lives. What was your question? If the price goes up to seven or eight or nine, um, uh, Will that will that feed into your uh, political? Will, will, will that by itself not move the country to action? And we wouldn't need uh, to actually interfere in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is uh, what you're advocating with uh, you know a scientific panel, a blue expert, a uh, blue ribbon expert saying this is the way it should be. Well, I guess the question was, you know, uh, can the free market, uh, the marketplace, you know, help us get out of this? Yes. Well, well, we have we have not addressed the political issue yet that we don't have a free market in energy in America. The fossil fuel industry is massively subsidized by a tune to almost, you know, the scientists are saying the whole fossil fuel industry, if you add it all up, they get almost a trillion dollars a year in various kinds of subsidies. It's enormous. The playing field is not anywhere near level. If we stop the subsidies of the fossil fuel industry, if we stop the subsidies of the nuclear power industry and made them face market economics, then people would switch to cheaper alternatives in a heartbeat. Wouldn't that mean the price would go down? The price of fossil fuel wouldn't go down, it would go up. If it, without their subsidies, uh, you know, the, if we if we paid the true price of a gallon of gasoline, uh, it'd be ten, fifteen dollars, you know, at least something like that. Oh. oh, yeah, it's a lot higher in other places, and they use the taxes to uh, promote you know ultra efficiency. So you know, you know, gasoline could get to be fifteen or twenty dollars a gallon very shortly, and if somebody was getting two hundred miles of the gallon in, in a clean vehicle. You would you would cut down the total amount of fossil fuel you're burning, you know, going into the atmosphere. You know, if we spent the money on energy efficiency at all levels, you could drop global warming gases, you know, by 50 percent in a short amount of time, in a, in a handful, you know, be a handful of years. Like Harvey Wasserman's book, Solar Topia, talks about steps that are things that are being done all over the world. In 2007. If we just spent the money on those things and went with it we'd be clear of fossil fuels in 20 years. That's the, the raw economics right now, but we don't have the political will. Ron, somebody else? Let's see. Russell, did you have a question? Yes. I was wondering on the solar panels, how much more energy do you get it like in a California, Arizona basis up here? Uh, well, uh, there, you know, when you're talking about solar, you know, obviously there are some climates, or, you know, some states that are a little bit sunnier than Chicago. But Chicago is not nearly the worst in the United States at all. You know, Chicago has uh, plenty of sunlight coming in, you know, all, you know, throughout the year. And besides that, you're not talking about just solar, you're talking about doing the cheapest efficiency things first. Um, you know, buildings with, with uh, insulation and retrofit and a few cheap things that, that pay back in a year or two. We're talking 20, 30, 50 percent return on your investment, 10 to 20 times better than leave the money in treasury bills. You can cut energy consumption in half. First 50 percent for most buildings is easy. So the nation as a whole, there's a huge uh, opportunity uh, to cut down the burning of all fossil fuels at all levels if we spend the money on efficient equipment of all kinds. But that takes political will again and it takes individual action. We, each of us individually has to learn and help our friends and neighbors learn. That's how the, how, that's how the knowledge spreads if it's not in the news, in the media. Yeah, okay. but my main point is uh, versus when you're out in the southwest there versus here, what would be the percentage difference of energy you get? You might get 20% more energy in the southwest than what you get here, but it's not like double or triple. Okay. Okay? Dave Zucker? What, which part of the United States gets, gets the least sunlight? Would that be like Seattle or somewhere around in there? Bridgeport. 
I would think uh, which part I have not studied that Dave. Honest to God, I don't know which state actually. I think they publish maps saying some of the places where you think wouldn't get a lot of sunlight get more than some others because of you know, cloud cover and other things. It's it's just scattered all over the country. But the new the new high efficiency solar panels, you know, develop heat and electricity in cloudy climates. You don't have to have direct sunlight anymore to get usable. Uh, energy from the sun. Why couldn't we use that hot air from the city council all the time? Uh, <laughs> Jeff Schrammer. <laughs> yeah, Andy, interesting stuff. I was preoccupied with otherwise having money. But it's good. It sounds like you're really on the ball tonight. Um, you, a few comments ago, a few questions ago, you talked about the Europeans and the taxes and all. Would I be correct to guess that you would look favorably upon a major readjustment of the U.S. tax system whereby the income and sales tax, stuff like that is phased out, and a fossil fuels consumption tax is phased in. What do you think of that? Well, yeah, uh, you talked about well, would we change, uh, would we change uh, tax, tax rates? Well, if I were president, the first thing I would do is reinstate the tax structure that we had during the Eisenhower years, you know, where uh, the rich people were called upon to pay their fair share. And we've been we've been running a welfare. America has been running the greatest welfare system on the planet for the last 30 years. It's called Reaganomics. It shovels money to rich people and all kinds of welfare for the rich programs through tax breaks and everything else. And we've got trillions of dollars of money have been taken out of the American economy and American net worth. If we change the tax structure to uh, you know favor. Uh, you know, treating everybody more or less fairly depending on their income level, it, it wouldn't hurt the super rich people. A person that's got five billion dollars now could easily get along with four billion or three and a half, and we'd have enough money left over. Like you know, one thing they were the Bush tax cuts, incidentally, are equal or greater. The the amount of tax that the rich people haven't been paying since the year 2000, the amount of taxes they haven't been collecting on the super rich are slightly more than our national deficit every year. We wouldn't have a, a deficit, we wouldn't be in the red ink if the rich were paying their fair share like they used to. So uh, there's, there's, if this is a moral issue. We have to decide as a country, are we going to still keep shoveling money to billionaires while the environment is going to hell in a handbasket? Mm. And if we're not going to put up with that, what are we going to do? Bob Rosenstein. Yeah. I, and me? To answer a question that's been giving me uh, uh, heart pain for a long time, juxtaposed with the subsidies we give to the fossil fuel industry, what about the failure of this solar energy uh, firm and all the fervor about that? And what do we do to prevent this from happening again where we have these uh, new uh, renewable energy firms coming up to give them help and substance so they can compete in the global marketplace? Okay, the question was, well, what can we do about the, the failure of solar energy companies is a predictable thing in America on cycles like this. Because whereas other countries give subsidies to new industries to level the playing field and try to get the technology out there, they might have subsidies for 15 or 20 years that businesses can plan for. In America, the subsidies are for a year or two or three. So uh, just when sales are beginning to pick up and the public's beginning aware, boom, December 31st, the subsidies quit and then companies can't compete anymore. Or they allow the dumping of cheaper, below cost solar panels in, in America to distort the market to kill the American solar industry. The fossil fuel industry with their wholly owned politicians in Washington have been promoting and killing energy efficiency and alternatives in solar for the last 30 years. It's a cycle that goes like this, up and down, up and down, up and down, and then all we see in the news is, well, solar energy can't compete in the United States. Solar energy is competing with fossil fuel all over the world where it's not being brutalized by the politicians. Okay. Does that answer your question? I think that's a very good response. Oh, uh, Linda Rios. Yeah, someone here spoke on I think it was thorium as being a substitute for nuclear energy, oh, yeah. uh, but it still has waste. What's, what was your, that? what's your quick opinion on thorium? What's my, the question is, what is my quick opinion on thorium? Well, thorium is uh, 
a new definition or a new, supposedly a new type of nuclear reactor, but you would still have to mine and mill uranium to run it in the first place. It's a nuclear reactor, and the cost per kilowatt of what you would get out of one of those things is so horrendous that uh, if we went through a thorium cycle, it would suck up a whole bunch of money that we could use to actually do something about this, the global warming problem while we have time to do something about it. If we, start, if we started pouring money into solar, uh, to the thorium nuclear plants right now, we would not get a kilowatt out of the first one before we're five years past the tipping point where the planet's going to warm up 10 or 11 degrees and it's going to be all over. So, you know, even, you have to look at, at the time frame we have to work with. And besides that, uh, you know, the, the thorium cycle with the nuclear plants and everything, it would not be able to exist without massive government subsidies and the Price-Anderson Act, which says that the nuclear industry is not liable. They don't have to pay for any kind of accidents. Okay? So uh, that, that's my quick answer. Okay. Ellen Hero? Okay, um, I have a couple questions. One is, um, how long do you think we have to turn this all around? <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> well, the question is, how long do we have to turn it around? A handful of years, not a decade. Uh, the, the, all of the articles, the one that's here tonight from Rolling Stone, if you log on to that website, incidentally, Rolling Stone has published articles and they're linked to a bunch of other stuff on global warming with Bill McKibben, they're all basically saying the same thing, that the data that's coming in year by year is surpassing the estimates they've been making about how fast this is happening. Each year, they gain more information about how fast the ice is melting in the Himalayas, how fast the ice, the hole in the ocean, uh, the clear ice, is, clear water is getting bigger at the North Pole. And the water's getting darker. I mean, uh, if there's no ice cover on it, it absorbs more sunlight. So we're very close to it becoming a self-perpetuating, uh, regenerating cycle that we won't be able to reverse. They, a lot of these scientists are saying we, we have to get a, a, a crash program going by 2015, a couple of years. We have to pressure our politicians now. This should be the number one crisis facing humanity in everybody's playbook. Okay, and I, I have like, uh, I know someone and he's like always talking about how it's a hoax, how global warming is a hoax. <laughs> and sure he's like, oh, well, sea levels haven't risen enough. It, it, or, well, he says they haven't risen, though. I, I think now it's been said they rose like a centimeter or, or so. Um, Take one of these articles. Take one of these with you to give it to him if you, if you know where he is. If he's in, in, not in a foreign country, you don't have to mail it to him. Uh, tell him to read this and log on to a couple of the others because uh, one of the um, the slogan that one of the uh, prime ministers of one of the islands, it's, it's on the third third page. At the Copenhagen summit, a spokesman for small island nations warned that many would not survive a two-degree rise. You know, they, they, some islands, they're close to sea level, I mean, just very bit above sea level. Some of the low-lying uh, islands have already disappeared, and people have had to move off of them. You know, from just a, a, a few inches of sea level rise, with the tide shifting and everything else. I mean, it's happening. It's happening right in front of our eyes. So don't let anybody tell you that global warming is a hoax and it's not happening. That's you know, the, the mainstream, uh, that's the talking point put out by uh, the employees of the fossil fuel industry. The, the employees I'm talking about are our senators and congressmen. All right. So this is where we are. Let's go uh, to rebuttals. I think our last question will be from the gentleman in the back, way back Somebody other hand there. Jesus. Who has had his hand up for a while. Yes. What else can you say? Yes. What's your question? The question is, uh, there's evidence uh, supposedly that uh, global warming is not global warming. It's 
is actually solar system warming because we see evidence that other planets like Jupiter, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are also warming up and heating up. What do you think of that? Yeah. That's, that's, again, that's one of the talking points put out by the climate deniers. Well, uh, there's overwhelming evidence among all the, the, the different climate stations around the country, people at, around the world, uh, they're in total agreement that global warming is happening. What they disagree on, and the, dis the, the disagreement is less and less, is how many degrees is it going to warm up in the next 20 years? You know, the, the computer models are getting better and better. And, and, and like they said, they, they predicted that the, the Arctic up near the North Pole might be ice-free in the summer by 2030. Well, now they're talking about 2015. You know, it's happening faster and faster, and there's no doubt, there's no debate on this. So when somebody tells you it's not happening, you look them right in the eye and say, time out, time out, that's a load of crimps. Criminally insane bullshit, and I won't have it in my presence. People are just flat out lying to you. These are talking points put out by the fossil fuel industry. Right. Well, there, uh, just to follow up, uh, if, uh, you know, the, it's not just planet Earth, but all the planets in the solar system, the solar system itself is heating up, maybe uh, we could be passing through some kind of radiation zone where, where the uh, radiation increases, and then, you know, Maybe. Is there a question in any of this? Yes. It, well, the question, it's possible that all of the planets may be slowly warming, but slow is a, a period over thousands of years rather than rapid in uh, 20, 30, 40 years. Well, we, in any case, we can't do anything about the other planets. I mean, we, we're stuck with this one. We have to uh, do, do what we can. Let's go to rebuttals. You know, all right. He had one last question there. All right. Uh, the question is, you know, this will be the last question. Uh, is I'll tell you my own personal opinion and what I've gathered from these other people. A lot of people are saying that our present situation with the political system doesn't look good. But if we don't try, if we don't make an effort, then then it's over anyway. So why not spend our last few years trying to do something constructive, and uh, we might make a difference. Uh, Amory Lovins wrote that in 1930, in a, uh, a book called Energy and War, Breaking a Nuclear Link. It said, you know, this is the Cold War. It looks like we're all going to blow ourselves up soon with nuclear weapons. So let's just relax and do something positive and move in a, a positive direction and see what happens. And we had an energy efficiency revolution. and. Eight years later, nine years later, the Soviet Union took down the Berlin Wall. You know, things things can happen fast once the public reaches critical mass and said enough is enough. You know, we, we could have a whole uh, presentation on that one night of classic movements that people have been struggling for years. And finally, you know, like people in, in some other countries, they just walk out the door at noon and shut the country down. I mean, you even talk about getting rid of universal health care anywhere in Europe, and you get, you know, uh, plastered as a politician in a short amount of time. The people just, some things are unthinkable once people have accepted that this is the direction we're going in. And Americans, we, we the first step is education, learning what's happening. Okay. And after that, we have to move. Rebuttals. Okay. All right. Uh, rebuttals, rebuttals. Yes. Uh, we're moving now to our rebuttal period. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I'd like to know how many people have remarks to make to the rest of us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and up here too. Nine, ten. About four minutes, Brom, if that. Uh, 20 minutes each. Uh, no. Uh, four five minutes. Uh, five minutes. No. Five. It's Three, too, too four much. About the four minutes, Brom. Well, here, but the question is who is going to keep the time? Uh, oh, I, you running because it? although I had a timekeeper, I left it home. I have it. Oh, my oh God. thank you, Gary. Put it back. No technology. You're, you're All right. Good. Gary, <laughs> Gary's heavy everyone. All right. Our first lucky rebutter is Bob Rosenstein. Bob, I wish you were here. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, first of all, I want to thank our speaker for putting on the table some very complex and painful issues that really uh, relate to our survival as a civilization. Uh, secondly, my, some of my remarks will be dedicated to the memory of uh, Will Shakespeare in the sense of uh, to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it is noble in the minds of men to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune like Katrina, uh, Sandy, the forest fires in Israel, and Russia, the terrible flooding in Pakistan, the 35,000 Europeans who died in a heat wave, the spreading northward of malaria, the rising sea levels, the uh, depletion of fresh water because of our addiction globally to fossil fuels. Or whether it's better to uh, take arms against the sea of trouble by opposing them and them. So from the point of view of uh, Hamlet, what can we really do to augment uh, this uh, terrible scourge of uh, climate change? Well, you know, you know, speaking personally, uh, I've tried to do a lot of things in my life. I don't know how successful I've been. You know, uh, we voluntarily, like with Don over there, Richie, we serve on the Air and Energy Committee of the Sierra Club. I work with the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, try to engage in this with the American Physical Society, American Chemical Society, and a member of, of the new climate group of the American Physical Society and the energy group there. I certainly have been in touch with uh, political leaders on this issue. Uh, one thing which I might relate to uh, was the comment on hydrogen that came up. Uh, in October 14, 2008, I attended a meeting at the Navy Pier that uh, uh, that my then Congressman Rahm Emanuel organized with T. Boone Pickens speaking on the Pickens plan, uh, the notion of fracking. And afterwards I went up to Pickens and asked him about uh, whether it would be better to uh, use hydrogen instead of uh, fracking for natural gas. My objection to fracking is what uh, our speaker said tonight, but also the fact that the uh, National Air and Ocean Administration has discovered that 2 to 8% of the methane is released uh, into the atmosphere during the fracking process. So uh, the claim by Rahm Emanuel and others that uh, natural gas is a good substitute for uh, coal now because it's a less of an emitter is uh, obviated by this terrible reality of the gas release into the atmosphere. So uh, I also wrote to Ram afterwards, and he sent me a Dear John letter. He's the person who really persuaded the president to uh, accept the Pickens plan for the uh, fracking of natural gas. And fracking is re exempt from uh, provisions under the Clean Air Act because uh, Dick Cheney met with the oil and gas industry during his Bush years, and they eliminated that from usage. So I think that uh, we really have to move forward on a global basis. I did have attend a meeting a year ago with, uh, at the Chicago Council on Science and Technology where some people from China spoke on their energy problems and we talked about uh, the uh, option of having uh, renewable energy there. We have to do this on a global basis because China is now the leading emit emitter and if we just uh, focus on the United States it's not going to work anymore. 30 seconds. So uh, I think we have, these are some of the things I have done and I think it's in line with uh, what Shakespeare advocated, that we have to take arm against, against the sea of troubles, and by opposing them, we'll end them. And we have to do all the things which our speaker said about, and other things which came up in the audience, too. The final thing we might do is nuclear fusion power, which is different than nuclear fusion, and I think we have to continue researching that area. Uh, time. Oh, great. Perfect. Great. Great. Well, thanks, Andy, for all the information uh, you provided in your talk and the uh, article you gave out. Uh, it begs the question, and you talked about it a little bit, mainly blaming our leaders about why uh, we haven't changed. But I think there are two factors that we ought, we ought to consider to a certain extent. And uh, one is the pogo factor. Uh, we have met the enemy and he is us. Uh, we got all this information around and we don't listen to it. We listen to Fox News. I don't turn that stupid TV on 2579 
uh, Fox. I don't watch any of those. 11 and 20 are bad enough. So, you know, if I watch TV, I watch those two channels unless I'm visiting somebody. So there's uh, all kinds of... And then there's the confusion factor. So there's the pogo factor and the confusion factor. Uh, I admit, and I've admitted it many times here, I'm not the brightest guy around. A few years ago, I heard of a film called uh, The End of Suburbia, put out by a bunch of progressives. The suburbs were going to end because the cost of uh, fossil fuels was going to get so high. Uh, that was, I'm, I don't know how long ago, a decade ago, two decades ago. Well, Andy lives in the suburbs, uh, and he's not lonely. There are all kinds of people still out there in the suburbs. So it's understandable that we uh, get confused. So you got denial, you know, the, the pogo factor, and you got confusion. Between those two, I can see, uh, I don't want to blame uh, totally uh, even Mitt Romney, bad as he was, and the president, even the president, but a lot of it is us. Thank you. So true. Um, my name is Doug Binkley. Uh, I've been an environmentalist for a long time. I was with the uh, Citizens Party uh, at the very beginning uh, back in 1980 when um, uh, a, a party that was founded by Barry Commoner and um, certain others. Uh, <clears throat> with the regards to uh, uh, trying to preserve the environment is one of the main uh, uh, one of the main themes. Um, I have. Um, I, there's so many things that I could say. I, I don't really know. I, I agree with so many uh, things that have been discussed here. Uh, I'm glad we have a uh, group here that's very uh, informed uh, on the subject, and I'm glad uh, our speaker has uh, brought uh, these issues to the fore. Uh, I think we are very close to the tipping point, as has been discussed. Uh, it's um, serious, uh, the uh, retreat of the glaciers. Uh, there's a movie that hasn't even been mentioned. Uh, about uh, chasing ice, I think it's called. I haven't seen it yet, but apparently, it really has a tremendous evidence on the, um, on the uh, uh, shrinking glaciers and a uh, uh, clear case of global warming. It's so difficult, though, because uh, um, we don't know exactly everything about the solar cycle and the solar constant. Uh, uh, it's not completely constant; it changes over time. Uh, uh, we know that we're at the near the end of an interglacial period, uh, so at some point, uh, um, in a normal course of events, there might be glaciers coming back, but uh, temporarily at least it is clear that uh, the carbon dioxide is correlated with the, uh, uh, the global warming at this time. And that, um, the intelligent thing as a species would be to respond to it, uh, and unfortunately we seem to be our own worst enemy in being addicted to these fossil fuels. Um, I'm glad uh, that Andy brought up something I didn't even know, that uh, possibly um, the people that are involved in pr promoting this uh, fracking, uh, they might be involved in, in this conspiracy to try to ruin our water supply. Um, it's a pretty terrible thing to consider that we have to uh, deal with that too. Um, as far as um, what we can do, uh, it does seem like uh, we've been presented with this fait accompli. Um, the global warming is going to continue. Uh, I kind of almost feel a sense of despair about it. Uh, I think that some of the technological solutions that have been proposed, like uh, sending up robots uh, uh, to try and shade uh, uh, some of the solar uh, emissions, uh, solar radiation from getting here, uh, uh, some of the things like uh, sending up uh, um, uh, plumes uh, over the ocean, or um, uh, adding um, uh, iron to um, algae, uh, uh, so that um, uh, there's all sorts of things. There, a lot of them have been uh, discussed about grand scale uh, technological attempts uh, to um, to reduce global warming in some ways, or scrubbing um, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere through artificial trees. People are working on that. It's, it's possible that some of these technological things will come along. This was what was briefly mentioned as being maybe the Manhattan Project is necessary. Uh, uh, 
possibly incremental things can do something to help, but we are very close to this tipping point. Uh, right. One of the things that wasn't mentioned was the permafrost issue uh, uh, in Alaska and Siberia and other places uh, where uh, if the ground uh, uh, unfreezes to a certain level, uh, methane that's uh, trapped there might uh, be released, and methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. So um, a lot of uh, food for thought, uh, Some, in some ways a doomsday scenario, but uh, again, remember that we had uh, all sorts of uh, possibilities for doomsday during the Cold War, and uh, very, uh, very quickly it changed from at least that terrible uh, conclusion. I thank you, Andy. Uh, a great talk, and uh, I just uh, try to add a few points. The first one is uh, global warming. I, I truly believe it's 100 percent there. Uh, without the scientific instrument, you just go out to any glacier uh, exist in the world, and they are all retreating for the last few hundred years. You you just have to go there and see the facts. And uh, no, nothing else, uh, you, nothing biased by anybody, and it's just there. Mm -hmm. The second is uh, the cause of that. Uh, I heard that people say that maybe solar system is warming up. Well, uh, I think physics, uh, they, they, they think, uh, yeah, it's warming up in the next uh, 10 billion years, and not in the last uh, 200 years. <coughs> uh, I didn't see any other explanation for global warming in the last couple hundred years is because of any uh, other reason. Okay, maybe it's hard to directly associate the, the global warming with carbon dioxide or methane, but uh, so far this is the only reason. Uh, we better prove, uh, trust that, otherwise uh, we may have a problem. Just based on that, that thing, uh, I think we, we should put some uh, more attention. Another is, uh, uh, okay, global warming is different from running out of oil when the oil prices are going up and they say, oh, oil is a, is a, is a problem, supply is running out of that and uh, U.S. Uh, national energy security is important. We should uh, produce more oil our, ourselves. I think uh, that's totally different from global warming. Global warming is a, it's a global issue. It's not U.S. issue. And uh, oil price security may be a U.S. issue. But here is a, a, a different opinion I, I'm uh, thinking. Oil is a limited resources. It's there. You, you use it and it's decreased less and less and it will be used out. For security reason, if we use more our domestic oil right now, in the future we will more depend on the foreign oil. So security is, I don't see any reason why we worry about security in order to produce more oil domestic oil, because you may secure for the next five years, ten years, but after that, your son and daughter and grandchildren will be more dependent on the foreign oil. It's a, I don't see that relationship. Uh, another thing is I saw an article that uh, for, for the past uh, election, less debate on the global warming. I think uh, two factors. Why is the uh, oil price dropped? People didn't think about energy much anymore. 30 seconds. Another is uh, European uh, was the big push for the global warming and their economy is uh, in problem. So the global warming issue is not uh, as hot as used be used to be. We need to put more things there. And the only solution I can see is carbon tax. We put something like cigarette tax and uh, to reduce the uh, global warming. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen,
<laughs> if I could tell you that your entire needs of a lifetime's worth of power could be put into a cup this size, would you believe me? No. 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 Yes. no. Yes. Yes. I believe it. If I could tell you that we do have a potential source of power that will solve global warming and power an industrial sized society for the next 5,000 years, would you believe me? Yeah. Oh. Maybe. If I was to tell you that that answer is nuclear power, would you believe me? No. no. Not really. If I was to tell you that, convinced that I agree completely with Andy Anderson on the conventional form of a light water reactor, that he's absolutely right. But because his views are not only shared by myself, but by the very creator and inventor of the light water reactor, a gentleman by the name of Alvin Weinberg. Alvin Weinberg talks about the Faustian bargain that conventional nuclear power makes. But he went on to engineer a solution called the liquid fluoride thorium reactor, where you use uranium U-233 to fuse a thorium blanket of free neutrons that converts itself back to uranium U-233 that then fuses and makes in the thing. And the biggest part about this, it doesn't need a lot of cooling apparatus and it operates at atmospheric pressure. What that means is that you can have a, a, a liquid fluoride thorium reactor the size of this room powering about half the city of Chicago. <coughs> and you'd have 100% burnoff. Sure, you'd still have some waste problems, maybe about a basketball size worth of waste product after 30 years it all would need to be sequestered for about 500 years. This is what Alvin Weinberg wanted to do with the thorium reactor. And he actually did a lot of the basic research at Oak Ridge Laboratories in the 1960s and the papers stayed hidden in a children's closet. As a matter of fact, Alvin Weinberg became so bitter about the invention of the light water reactor that was becoming in so commonplace that it was actually fired by the Nixon administration by a congressman who said, well, if you're so upset about nuclear power, why don't you get out of the nuclear business? Alvin Weinberg then spent the rest of his life promoting the benefits of the liquid fluoride thorium reactor and thorium nuclear power. Thorium is also very plentiful. About a football field size, thorium would do it. And we have it right now. We don't need to mine it because its components are in rare earths. And those parts are everything from the neo from the neodymium magnets in your little headphones to your other consumer electronics. So we don't really need to mine it. It's already there. It just needs to be put into good place and use. You also need a base fuel of uranium U-233. The government's got at least 35 truckloads sitting in storage right now. So for me, uh, it's something that we really need to look at. And I mean, if you do not believe me, Go to the Thorium Alliance website. Take a look up there. As a matter of fact, John Koontz, who presented here, that very video is up there along with many other things. And then, yes, next year in May, they're going to be having another Thorium Alliance conference right here in Chicago, if you want to look at it. And there are plenty of videos up there now. Myself, I would not be taking a day off work to go tape something like this unless I thought it was a real solution. So whatever you have with the pundit tree or whatever, Take a look at the evidence. Andy's always saying, so am I. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, yes. And again, thank you, Andy, for a nice talk. Let me thank you in advance. I'm a little early tonight. I'm going to be eclectic as usual. Of course, I agree with Tim. We need all lots of technology, especially technology like thorium reactors, which they won't be operational for at least 10 more years, yeah, if not 100 years, yeah, you know. Um, yes, we need uh, more nuclear reactors here. Um, you know, Ed Ponder used to come here. I used to love to have Ed Ponder here, and we had other guys here. I've actually run into them in Washington in Congress. They have devices that are going to save the United States in the energy situation. 
They actually show up in congressional offices. I, I, I'm serious. And they want venture capital. Ed Ponder had a machine. He actually had an industrial size, and he also had a home version. And you could take an old couch, and instead of throwing it in the alley or something, you could throw it in his machine, and he'd get 10 gallons of high-grade octane. That's the, the gas you could put in your car. <laughs> but unfortunately, he never got it operational. All right, the other thing is regarding, uh, it's a big topic, sir, regarding your answer. Um, I'm part of the Al Gore's Climate Reality Project in the Speaker Bureau. The leader, the guy in charge of my unit, is a professional astronomer. And he does not give credibility to that solar warming thing. At least he dismisses it and doesn't give it any credibility. <laughs> and I have to defer to him since that is his chosen field. One of the things about global warming, I came across it this week. Uh, two to three billion people of the earth uh, burn coal, wood, or some sort of fuel to make their food every day. So in terms of the pollution that's out there, um, there's a lot to this topic. I mean, I go to conferences last all week to encapsulate it here. You're a pretty good solar guy. You're, you have nothing, you're weak on transportation. Uh, our current transportation, 90% of it is oil-based. Um, Roy, my friend Roy, air, airliners are, are terrible polluters. The particulate matter that comes out of one airplane is equal all to the leaves of grass on Earth. They're like flying gas stations. There are no emission standards for airplanes. We have a PowerPoint for our railroad thing in which we compare railroads. The other thing about automobiles is the inherent cost. Uh, you have to think about the car now. Rockefeller was largely, we associate him with the Standard Oil of Ohio, but what he was producing when he made his money was kerosene. And one of the byproducts was gasoline. And quite frankly, he didn't know what the hell to do with it. And he was very much involved in the development of the internal combustion engine. And part of global warming, I'd say the essence of global warming is gas. And it's not just some miracle gas and things like this. There's, I won't get into the chemistry, but what you're talking about hydrogen and things like that. And I was picking on the, the refrigerant guy here, the HVAC repairman here. What do I got? 30. Oh, all right, because of the refrigerant that's going up there. The gas you're putting in there is even small amounts of certain gases are terrible. You've got to be very cautious of what things like methane and things like that. Uh, to say we need any kind of automobile is spurious. Uh, it, it bothers me that I wait each day and there's a four lane highway. I wait for a bus when I get on that's crowded. The new CTA cars have aisle seats facing either down the column or uh, bowling alley type seats. So people, they can get more people on there on vehicles like this. Uh, to stand and crowd more in there when, when 500 cars pass me by. What the, the biggest affluent, uh, the worst industry in the world is concrete and what do you make highways out of? Concrete. Exactly. There's nothing worse than concrete. What about goes into cars? Concrete. Rubber, glass, uh, the metal, yeah, petroleum based plastics, things of that nature. And last thing I want to show you about here, I, I, could, I could benefit you in some things here on transportation. We have a PowerPoint, that's part of our thing on high-speed rail. But one thing that disturbs me about transportation, this is the latest issue of Trains Magazine. And you see there are factory where they're making high-speed rail cars. This is up in Milwaukee. The only thing about this picture is there's no one working in it because they closed it. <laughs> there are two finished railroad sets for sale because Wisconsin doesn't want it. That's what I mean. We don't want cars. This is what we want. Amen. That's it. If you go to my reasons for rails on my website, it will give you all the data and information on it. Otherwise, thanks a lot. Got the topic out there, and that's what we have to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Huh. All right. I'm usually not eclectic, but I'm going to be eclectic today. <laughs> Um, 
the thought about uh, the whole solar system is warming up, so maybe that's that we should just learn to live with it. Oh my God. It's like we have a planet that in at least a billion years has stayed in a very comfortable temperature range. All right, something suitable for life. And it's a planet that has fire and ice on it. And what we're doing is melting the ice on purpose. And then we're saying, well, the universe is, you know, the solar system's heating up. Let's live with it. It's like, it's going to, what, what the guy is saying is, we're moving to becoming a lifeless planet. That's so sh short-sighted, you know? If you're moving, if the universe, if the solar system is heating up, and we're moving towards becoming a lifeless planet, let's save the ice that's going to help us, you know? The other thing, many years ago I had this, um, saw this, saw something on television which was a story about a guy who could take water in the 30s and you add a pill to it, it turns into gasoline, but the powers that be destroyed it. And I was like, look at that, yeah, powers. It wasn't until later in my life that I realized how much bullshit that was. <laughs> it's like, what is water? Water is hydrogen and oxygen. Water is, you can think of water as burned hydrogen. It's already combusted. You're not going to add a pill to it and turn it into something else that you're going to combust. You know, it's just not going to happen. Water is already combusted. It's combusted hydrogen. It's already burned. You're not going to burn it a second time. The interesting thing about um, the tax on fuel is it reminds me of the tax on cigarettes. It's like raising the tax on cigarettes, raising the tax now, it's 10 bucks a pack. And, it's, and <laughs> governments rely on this money, but they're driving people out of the business of smoking cigarettes. And then the money dries up. And then it's like, where are we going to find some more money? This money's dried up. And that seems like the same thing with the tax on fossil fuels. It's like, let's drive it to 10 bucks a gallon so nobody uses it. But then, or 100 bucks a gallon so nobody uses it. And then it's like, but we're relying on this money, but nobody's spending this money. So very interesting problem. The other interesting thing, of course, not of course, but the other interesting thing is, the thought about all of us having like solar panels and being like net exporters. And the interesting thought was that you got to take like our current system of having like a centralized power generation, right? And then you realize that that central plant cost is spread out over all the users, all right? And it works out to like pennies a kilowatt. But what happens when people go off grid? And of course, when a few people go off grid, nothing happens. But what, was that three minutes? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. If a few people go off grid, nothing happens. But there's going to come a point where there's so many people off grid that you got to spread the fixed cost of that power plant over a smaller base. And then that drives the cost of electricity up. And then more people go off grid. So that's like very interesting. Um, that's all. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks, Andy, for a stimulating presentation tonight. Uh, first, I want to talk about this business about the sun warming all the planets up. Well, that, that is not true. Uh, you can go over to skepticalscience.com. And they debunk all that stuff there, and they even have a nice chart on there of solar irradiance, which we're pretty good at measuring. We've been measuring it at least since 1880. And from 1880 to about 1960, it was the sun was hotter. It, it was going up. But since 1960, the sun has actually been cooling. So we've been the sun's been cooling for 50 years now. We're going back down. And, and right now, we're right about... Uh, at the point we were at, if, if you look at, uh, you know, it's kind of a sawtooth. If you, uh, if you look at the sawtooth, the peaks and valleys, we're right now at where we were at about 1880. If you look at the 11-year average, 
we're about where we were at, oh, let's say in uh, 1945 or so. So, anyway, so check that out. Um, also, again, subject to transportation, especially uh, public transportation, I came up with an idea. Maybe I can get citizens taking action to endorse this and back me up on it, and we can present it at the, at the uh, meeting on Lake Street. I call it the 10 15 25 plan. And that's where we have, so I'm proposing that all CTA pensioners take an immediate 10% cut in their pensions, and all current active CTA employees take a 15% cut in their pay, and then all, whether they're pensioners or actives, all of them pay 25% of their health costs. And I think with that plan, I think there'd be enough money in the budget that we would not have to raise fares. And as a matter of fact, I think we could even have a fare decrease and restore service. So think on that one for a little while, Charlie. I have. See, it really did. The 10, 15, 25 plan. Very easy. And in, in light of all the sacrifices that the private sector has made, uh, I think that I think that they, the public, we can expect the public sector to share in the pain a little. When I get on a bus, I don't tell the driver pay my bus fare. We're not telling him to pay your bus fare. We're telling him. Hey, well, here's the thing, you're not going to have... Hey, one fool at a time, y'all. Having a train system does no good if you can't afford to pay the people to run it because they're making six-digit incomes. Oh. And they have this golden, you know, parachute, to, you know, yeah. golden uh, health care plan and, and all this stuff. So, okay, and now the... Now a big uh, big part of the uh, a big part of the CO2 problem is based on transportation, as we all know, and the number one driving force that well, the number one uh, item that determines whether someone will ride a bike or walk or take transit is density. It's population density. When you live close in. You can walk and ride your bike and, and take transit. It's not so bad. 30 seconds. But when you start living in Algonquin and places like that, you've got to have a car. You gotta it's 38 miles. However, very convenient. There's, a, there's a simple way that they could do tomorrow with a stroke of a pen to increase density. And that, my friends, is instituting a land value tax. Oh. We institute a land value tax. What, what's going to happen? The reason people drive so much, because you know, we're a land of real estate speculators. Why would somebody want to pay, you know, three hundred thousand for a house in Bridgeport when they can go like thirty miles away and pay a hundred thousand, and you're saving two hundred thousand? It's that makes it cheap. You could drive a Cadillac to work every day with the money you save on, on the real estate. But if you uh, had a land value tax, that's going to level that out, and and it would make it more affordable Time. for people Time. to stay in the city and Time. not have to drive. Time. <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank Andy for his talk. It's rare, Andy, when I find that I was in 100% agreement with everything you had to say, but so be it. It was an excellent talk, and you put out a lot of important stuff there. Um, that, and, and I would also like to say that, number one, I was a student at Emerson Township High School in 1970 when we had the first Earth Day. And one of the speakers was Dr. Roger Charlier, who was, I believe, the head of the biology department at, at Northeastern. And Dr. Charlier pointed out in his talk to us that day that mankind isn't going to, end, uh, uh, to put it in those politically incorrect terms from those days, that mankind isn't going to end in a expl nuclear explosion it's or with a whimper, it's going to end with a gasp. Oh. And I fear that we have not pro progressed much from those days. And with regard to the scientists, scientists have been taking roles in politics for a long time. Anyone who doubts that should go back to the 50s and look at the work of Albert Einstein, for example, and his fight for disarmament. Yep. And the work of people like Dr. Einstein and more recent scientists needs to go forward. 
and they cannot be permitted to hang back. Finally, that brings us to the comments from our fellow student, uh, the Hoosier in the room uh, back there. <laughs> and, his, and his comments about asking CTA employees to pay their fair share of the load, he seems to want to, as usual, go back to the days when there was no safety net, when Benjamin Harrison was the President of the United States, <laughs> and when people admired the poetry of James Whitcomb Riley. Yes. Uh, those days have long since passed. Instead, um, I would suggest that, pass, that bicycle riders who are taking Nickty, the South Shoreline, should carry their share of the load and put a 20 buck fee on the bicycle, $10 per axle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I would also say that part of the political gridlock in Washington isn't only due to the Democrats. Back in the 1950s, when we had a better Republican president than most have come down the pike since, his name was Dwight Eisenhower. And President Eisenhower, shortly after he took office, received a visit from the hardliners of his era, Robert Taft, uh, Kent, uh, Senator Weary, uh, Everett Dirksen, and um, William Nolan, and so House Speaker Joseph Martin and some of the others, and they said, now we're going to repeal the New Deal and all this stuff. And President Eisenhower told them that he wasn't going to start any new social programs, but he was not going to take away from the people what they had already been given. And he essentially told them that it wasn't 1860 out here anymore, and if the Republican Party, which was a minority party, he said, was to pro grow and to prosper, it had to live in the modern world with everybody else. Thank you. And, and finally, when they made a subsequent visit, the president told them that any <coughs> party that does not stand by unemployment insurance, social security, and a farm program wasn't going to make it. Thank you. Okay. Well, okay. Um, Andy, where are you? Are you? Yeah, the, I can well imagine Frank uh, would have loved to have been here, but he had another thing that he stuck his Friday for the night. And, uh, but as it was, I do know good so I'll, I'll wager you that it was good stuff. It's not my field of expertise. But um, my question to you. Your answer to it left a certain amount to be desired. I want to talk about that, and then I'm going to get into some broader issues of the situation pertaining to the specifics of what you talked about tonight. Um, I ran past you a revenue neutral, uh, a major drastic adjustment in the tax code, and your response was along the lines of let's, let's tee off, so to speak, on the 1%. Well, I'll put it to you this way. If the situation on the climate is anywhere near as dire, as you're suggesting, where we've only got a handful of years or some such. Um, the 1%, once they get hip to the idea that they're going to be the big targets of all of this, they will dig in their heels and they will block everything you want to do. Um, the only chance you have, it seems to me, to get them to acquiesce in any sub substantial changes in such a short span of time, especially, are if you have a revenue neutral adjustment of the tax code rather than trying to squeeze more money as such out of the public in, in any part of the public indeed um, in, in an economy which is obviously in any case declining. Yeah, the, so the burbs haven't disappeared so far but you can just go up and down streets and see storefronts that used to be occupied that no longer are. Touché. Okay, and every year it seems for the past handful of years we've had one hammer blow to another to this economy. The most recent one was a bridge falling apart <coughs> in Jersey, I guess it was. No, no, no. The bridge, that was St. Paul. Was it St. Paul? Okay. Oh, it was I-35. Whatever. Whatever. There was a, and I understand there was a bridge in Jersey that was oh, fixed as recently okay. as four years ago. This just happened last night or something. Oh, that was last night. And, uh, you know, well, okay, four years, and within four years, the damn thing fell, like, fell again. I wonder how many times in human history that's happened where they said something was fixed and then within four years it fell apart. So my, in all likelihood what's going on is that the whole system is crumbling. 
and we've got we're, we're, we're in all likelihood at or past peak cheap oil, peak financial system integrity and stability, peak political system integrity and maybe financial stability, and peak journalistic integrity. And probably also, I'm going to guess, although I don't have the qualifications, I, don't, I haven't studied it like you, you and Frank have, well, peak climate stability. So I'm tempted to suggest, folks, that uh, I mean, if you, can, if you make wise decisions, you've got at least a, an outside chance of actually getting something done in, in the political system worth doing. And otherwise, you know, the, the, well, another way to go, I suppose, for some people at least, is to just think in terms of their personal legacy, to try to create little oases of cultivation, if not wisdom, in what's likely to turn out to be and is already in the process of becoming a sea of ignorance. And there's all sorts of ways to try to do that. Fortunately, for those of us who, 30 okay. seconds, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, for those of us who live in town here, this town, in my judgment, has as good a chance as any major town anywhere in the world of getting through at least a lot of this with minimal damage compared to what's going to happen to much, if not most, of the rest of the country and a whole bunch of the rest of the world. And that even assumes, that assumes that the climate stays the same. All these other things are so crap, in particular peak oil. You know, so, you know, it's the, the, the whole bunch of us have a hell of a road to hope. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Um, all right. I, actually, I think Jeff is way too optimistic. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, but um, first of all, I just want to—I just want to say to Andy, where, where's Andy? Right oh, here. oh, behind me. Oh, okay. I just want to say this is a terrific. This is the best presentation I've ever heard you give at the College of Complexes. Yeah. So outstanding. <laughs> all right. All right. Now. Okay. So, um, so I just—I want to be, you know. I'm, I'm going to be, like Charlie, I'm going to be kind of eclectic and skip around a little bit, but first of all... He's like you, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. So first of all, now the one, one point I would, I would disagree with, would have to disagree with you on, it has nothing to do with global warming, but it's about the whole question of, of the, the, this whole argument about black people being three-fifths of a person. Now, now what I want to say... Um, First of all, that you, you hear that cited a lot to, to, to as a, as a, that's supposed to be an indication of how racist the United States is. And that really isn't understood well. Um, now, what, where, where, that, where that idea comes from is, is from the U.S. Constitution where, and that was actually uh, where what, what happened was there was a, at the time the Constitution was written, about half of the states, all of them in the North had outlawed slavery, and the other half, all of them in the South, still had it legal. And, and so what the argument was, um, a lot of the Southern states were kind of underpopulated compared to the Northern states. And so uh, there were some people who wanted, who wanted to have congressional... They, they had already agreed that there was going to be there were going to be two houses in the Congress, the Senate uh, with with equal number of guys from each state and a House of Representatives, which would be proportional representation uh, based on population. Uh, but then the argument was, in the, when we have the census, we have the census every ten years to determine population. So the question is, in the census, do we count all the people? or just all the citizens, because in the southern states you had this large population of people, uh, the slaves, who were not citizens. And, 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 the, and the, the southerners who uh, said, yes, we should count all the people, citizens or not. You can count all people even if they're slaves. Northerners said, no, count only the citizens. That would, of course, mean the South would be less represented in Congress. And the compromise they worked out is, we'll count slaves three-fifths for purposes of congressional representation. That was comp so, that was, so that was a compromise. It had nothing to do with racism, although American society was very racist. That particular deal had nothing to do with racism. Okay, it has nothing to do with global warming. Okay, uh, all right. Now, the other thing I, I just want to say to Mike, um, 
to, to Mike Fo okay I, I want to say to Mike uh, Mike Foley uh, Al Gore has really done a lot to fight global warming he campaigned for it in Congress I mean he campaigned against global warming in Congress he also he wrote the book Earth in the Balance and he made the film An Inconvenient Truth and and he how, actually he's done a heck even not being president he's done a heck of a lot more to fight global warming than than Barack Obama uh, ever did now, okay now the other thing I would just say is that to people, to people who say that global warming is a hoax, uh, you can just ask the person this. Said global warming. Wait, wait, hey, what? Uh, one fool at a time, Mike. Uh, now, to people who say that global warming is a hoax, I would just say, okay, what if, what if all the scientists are right? Okay, you know, you say, oh, they're wrong. We got nothing to worry about. Everything's going to be fine. But what if they're right? Um, all right. Stay preppers. Oh, okay. Now, um, time's up. oh, my time's up? Yes, oh, okay. <laughs> this is a $750. I was at, I was at that Seekers meeting last night. <coughs> I kind of wish it were on tape or something, but I guess it's not. But there was a meeting about this, uh, the advertised topic was trust. As the discussion went on, it kind of dawned on me that the essential problem in uh, uh, labor relations and gun control is trust. The two sides don't trust each other. And that's why they're at each other's throats all the time. And maybe if we could trust, learn to trust, and it would be not only to learn to trust, but to be trustworthy, which I don't think anybody's really worried about too much. Maybe we could bring some sort of reasonable conclusion to these long-running controversies. And I felt pretty encouraged last night. Well, tonight I'm feeling pretty discouraged. Uh, I've long had a... Well, there's a great overemphasis, including here at the college, on the idea of generating political will. And how are you going to do that in two years? I mean, you haven't done it in decades. Well, that hasn't been explained. And I've... Uh, and a notion that you don't generate political will, you don't generate, you don't operate through the political process, you operate through the economic process. Take a variation of Grover Norquist's idea of starving the beast. Except, I, you know, he, he's operating only through the political process, and he's only looking at the welfare beast. I don't think he said anything about the military beast. Or the fossil energy beast, or the nuclear power beast. But I think that's what we have to think about. I don't think we're going to, for a long term solution, I don't think we're going to get anything in a couple of years. One thing encouraging, I think I can say for right now, I don't think the, the Mayan prediction, it always this isn't exactly a Mayan prediction, it's a Mayan locker prediction in that. The world's going to end on, uh, on December 21st. You know, I don't think even the College of Complexes believes that because it's scheduled up through next January. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I kind of doubt that we're going to uh, that global warming is going to end the world anytime real soon. I, I do think it is a real problem. I mean, you can look at planet Venus which is something like it's 700 or 800 degrees. I mean, that's what, what, what an extreme version of global warming can result in. But uh, I don't think we're, we're, obviously we're nowhere near close to that. And I do think it is exaggerated in a lot of ways. But I, I think it's kind of a proxy battle between those who think... Uh, 30 seconds. Uh, Resource consumption is excessive, and those who don't think it's excessive. 
That's pretty much where your deniers and undeniers kind of line up. But anyway, I do feel discouraged today. I was feeling encouraged last night. You know, I think if we can learn to develop trust. And I had a six-month-old, about 40 years ago, I had a six-month-old kitten <coughs> who had a, just a very passing ploy in trying to develop trust of a declawed cat. And I think maybe we ought to be, I think he's a lot smarter than a lot of people in a lot of ways. Uh -huh. Thank you, Bill Wallace. Michael Foley. I'm Michael Foley. Nobody has to believe a word I say. <laughs> believe Al Gore. Al Gore has gone all over this country saying every single word that comes out of his own mouth is a lie. Al Gore says you can burn a billion tons of coal, a billion barrels of oil, and as long as you pay off no. and get a piece of paper that says carbon credit, it does not pollute, it does not cause global warming, it does not melt ice, it does not cause anybody any respiratory problems. That's what Al Gore has said. You can burn anything you want, and as long as you pay off, you're okay. No pollution, no nothing, no bullshit, no nothing. Al Gore is the one who has said that he himself is the world's biggest liar. Not me. I'm saying Al Gore has said he himself is a liar. Okay. Let's wrap it up, Andy. All right. Thank you. Well, well, it's no good. Yeah. Well, that's right. Everybody pretty much uh, covered a few things uh, I left out. Gene Arthur was talking about uh, the pogo factor. Well, <laughs> in the article, um, he, he commented on that. He said, we've met the enemy, and the enemy is Shell. <laughs> I mean, uh, we have to stop thinking of the fossil fuel companies as our friends. Uh, it's, it's a moral and ethical issue. Uh, this is not a technical issue at all. It's one of morals and ethics. How much are we going to put up with, and how much, how much damage are we going to allow? Or are we going to make... Are we going to make an effort to try to save the, the future viability for our, our grandchildren? You know, the, the children that are here, 25, 30 years old, uh, it'll affect them, but the grandkids, they're going to live long enough to see a, a different planet if we, if we don't get moving. I have, have a question. Um, or a simple observation for anyone promoting the benefits of highly efficient, you know, if they were clean, new nuclear power plants. Yes. Develop, building a new line of nuclear power plants is like a um, it's like a trauma surgeon in, in an emergency room situation. A patient is coming in, and he's got a. a a cut in one of his major arteries and he's going to be bleeding to death in the next two or three minutes if the surgeon doesn't take proper action. So the surgeon says, well, let's, let's pour money into developing a new blood clotting agent and we'll, we'll have it in two years and we could just spread, spread it on the wound and stop the bleeding. Well, developing a blood clotting agent uh, while your patient is bleeding to death in front of you shows a lack of grasp of the reality of the time of the situation. It's a, it's a fundamental lack of grasp on reality. There's, there's nothing wrong with developing a blood clotting agent, just like nothing wrong with developing new nuclear power plants. But I don't oppose the research at all. The idea is the patient is bleeding to death right in front of our eyes, and we have to address that or nothing else is going to matter. Gotcha, and uh, you know Charlie is absolutely right, but what I didn't get a chance to talk about <clears throat> is that um, on my card there's some websites. There's a website called Want to Know Info. It's the single most hopeful, beneficial site I know of. It talks about good things that are happening all over the place, all over the world, mm -hmm. and other societies are you know, <coughs> redesigning their cities around walkable, everything, uh, mass transit, uh, all kinds of, you know, human-friendly cities where cars aren't needed. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, totally on board with that. So 
someone was talking about uh, water is combusted hydrogen. It's absolutely correct, but water can be separated again into hydrogen and oxygen through the simple process of, uh, I think it's called electrolysis, isn't yep. it? Yeah. Where you, use, uh, you can use solar or wind-generated electricity and separate it into hydrogen and oxygen in two tanks and then reburn it and you get clean water vapor. I believe there are quite a few projects around the world that are already doing that. Uh, there, there's, on each one of these subjects, there's just so much that you, know, you could spend 10 or 20 hours in a, in a, a weekend yeah. seminar talking about <coughs> the various projects all over the world. My point is, our media doesn't tell us about any of this stuff. You have to look to the internet, friends, neighbors, somebody that you know was at a conference or something and said, hey, uh, I got this, got some information here, look at this, that. That's why I carry these cards with the portal websites on them. Um, Rocky Mountain Institute is a tremendous solution. Uh, you know, the think, think and Do Tank, the Apollo Alliance is a, a crash program started by a, a group of businesses trying to move the debate forward. These things get no media coverage in the United States at all. It's just incredible. Um, uh, in a question, um, Bob Matter talked about uh, solar irradiation. Maybe uh, we're getting a little less sunlight than we used to. The difference between the incoming sunlight and the greenhouse gases warming up, those are two different things. We can be getting 5% less solar radiation, but if the planet is trapping 50% more of the incoming light, you're still going to be warming up, which is what they're, they're measuring the loss of ice on the ground everywhere. It's right in front of our face. You cannot deny this anymore and be what I call a based in the reality based community. We have too many people that are living in what one author I think it was Stephen Pizzo, uh, it runs a, a, a website called News For Real. He published a book in 2007, uh, an article rather, it's called, the title of it is A Disneyland of Militant Ignorance. <laughs> That's where we are in America. It's a Disneyland of militant ignorance where people are absolutely confident, militant in their promotion of views that are 180 degrees out of phase from observable reality. And I, I think it's a problem almost unique to America because of what our corporate news sources are doing. So, the last thing I'll leave you with, remember that title, Charlie, because that, that describes what we see here at this podium some nights. But Disneyland, you know, it's an ignorance in the rebuttal period. It was pretty good, I have to say. <laughs> But some nights it's a, a thing to behold. <laughs> I like Bill Wentz's uh, uh, you know, remarks on uh, developing trust. Uh, you know, there's the Want to Know Insight, the Want to Know Info website. Their motto is for a brighter future, and they're constantly prompting you to go here, or go there, see a beneficial thing that this community was doing, or see what. You know, hundreds of teenagers are doing over here, volunteering their time. There's a wealth of beneficial knowledge going on, but that that wealth of 10,000 good things is drowned out on the 2579 news by somebody talking about the latest 7-Eleven holdup. We see five categories. Count them on your hand. The five basic categories. One of those categories, something is going to be the lead story every night. Rape, robbery, murder, train wreck, and plane crash. Fire. Those, those fire. general fire. five, fire. one fire. of those five categories. Fire. Huh? Fire. Oh, fire. Well, yeah, fire. That train wreck or plane crash, right? <laughs> or five. Yeah, something yeah. like that. But it's always the lead story is always the disaster where we can change the debate completely if you start carrying information with you. Uh, a list of good things that are happening all over the place. I'd like to do a program some night where we just talk about the, an hour of beneficial things that have been happening in the last 25, 30 years everywhere. Thank all of you. Good night. All right. Thank you all for coming and for your contributions and rebuttals and questions and uh, attention.